Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. This hearing is entitled Protecting Investor Interests, Examining Environmental and Social Policy and Financial Regulation. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous material to the chair for inclusion in the record. And I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. We're here today to ensure U.S. markets remain healthy, vibrant, and the envy of the world. This year, our committee has found bipartisan agreement on solutions to strengthen our public markets and increase opportunities for all investors. I hope we can continue that constructive work today. Unfortunately, we've seen a disturbing trend in the Biden administration's approach to regulating our capital markets, particularly at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Rather than focusing on sound financial regulation, the SEC has turned its attention towards non-material, environmental, social, and political issues. This misguided approach has led to increased costs and burdens for those participating in the U.S. public markets. These politically motivated regulations not only discourage private companies from going public, but also hinder the competitiveness of American public companies. The everyday investors who rely on financial returns for their uh, retirement savings bear the brunt of these consequences. Today, we will discuss a slate of proposals that provide common sense solutions to strengthen our public markets. To be clear, uh, these are not uh, about delivering a message. They're about making a difference and making a meaningful change to protect investors and ensure our public markets, our markets, remain robust and competitive. First, we must take uh, make necessary reforms to the proxy process to restore its efficiency in promoting long-term shareholder value. We must prevent shareholder uh, activism from diverting attention and resources away from the core issues at hand. To be clear, I support shareholder democracy, but it should be their say, not external third parties who exploit the existing process to impose their own social and political beliefs into and onto American public companies. This undermines the very principles of democracy and transforms corporate boardrooms into political platforms, overshadowing sound financial decision making. Ultimately, this harms everyday investors in our public markets. Second, we must address the burdensome climate reporting and other requirements imposed by the Biden administration's Securities and Exchange Commission. The SEC has proposed a 500-page climate disclosure rule that would replace voluntary sustainability reports with mandatory disclosures. And the question of materiality is, is uh, really thrown out the window. This includes demanding detailed emissions data and climate risk management strategies, even when that information is not material to the company's business or their inner workings. The SEC is not a climate regulator, nor has Congress authorized it to mandate environmental policy via the disclosure regime. In fact, Republicans have consistently voiced concerns with the multitude of existing disclosures imposed by the SEC and emphasize the need for simplification rather than added complexity. Finally, many on the left have raised concerns that we are not keeping up with our European counterparts in addressing environmental and social issues. They argue we should mirror the European approach rather than protecting our interests from the extraterritorial reach of foreign regulators. They won't allow European bureaucrats to dictate these priorities because they've been unable to legislate them here in the United States on the wider economy and the wider populace. What this really comes down to is, an internet, is international competition. We will not be able to maintain our standing as the world's most envied capital markets by taking misguided cues from other countries. The legislative proposal before us today aimed to tackle these issues head on. It's time to get politics out of corporate boardrooms and discourage financial regulation from being weaponized to drive far left environmental and social policy. By doing so, we can ensure that our markets remain competitive and enable American companies and workers to thrive. I yield back and I will now, the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the committee, the gentlewoman from California for four minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Today's hearing marks the beginning of a month-long Republican offensive to feed the daily outrage 
machine of Fox News and its extreme mega Republican allies. This housewide effort is meant to divide Americans by ripping freedoms, rights, and opportunities away from women, people of color, and members of the LGBTQ community. That is the true meaning of the term anti-woke. And that's what today's hearing is really about. But none of this should come as a surprise to those of us who follow the work of this committee. In January, after assuming the majority, Republicans gutted Congress's first ever diversity and inclusion subcommittee, a subcommittee I established in 2019. Since then, and despite promises made by the chair, Republicans have done absolutely nothing to examine racial or gender inequality in financial services. In January, rather in February, the committee debated its first bill of the new Congress. Was that bill to address inflation? No. Was it a bill to address housing affordability? Wrong again. No, that bill wasn't even a bill. It was a meaningless resolution condemning the non-existent threat of socialism in America. We've also had three of the largest bank failures in our nation's history. In response, Republicans rushed to the floor to do nothing. Instead of using floor time to deal with the real crisis facing the American people, Republicans stoked the culture wars by using Fox News misinformation about a federal housing finance agency decision that was designed to increase home ownership for the middle class, replacing it instead with a new $5 billion tax on future home buyers. This is why I called it the Mega Housing Scam Act. Today is the first of six hearings this month where Republicans will partner with a network of dark money, climate deniers, and conspiracy theorists to wage their latest culture war against responsible investing and divert attention away from what really matters in people's lives. The Republican effort to dismantle ESG is integral to their agenda to gut diversity and inclusion across the board. Let's not forget that after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, before even bothering to address concerns from depositors, some Republicans suggested SBB failed because it had one black board director. Let's set the record straight with data. The research closely, clearly shows that 80% of investors are supportive of ESG information because it empowers them to do whatever they want with their money. That's why I say that ESG should really stand for empowering shareholder growth. ESG isn't just about values, it's about value. Yes, investors need to know how companies are addressing climate risk, how they pay their employees, how diverse their workforce is, and more. Investors want this information because it's good for the performance of their investments, which is also good for society. That's as capitalist and as American as it gets. While I believe that the series of hearings this month is a terrible use of this committee's time, rest assured that committee Democrats will continue to thwart this anti-capitalist, anti-investor, anti-business, and anti-American effort. With that, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. We'll now recognize the chair of the Oversight and Investigations Subcommittee, Mr. Heisinga, as leader of this effort, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, across our country, investors are being held hostage by those who want to maximize, who don't want to maximize retirement profits, but rather seek to push a far left social and political agenda. Forcing lower returns on Americans who are trying to build a secure financial future is wrong. This approach undermines traditional and frankly legal government structures and has turned our financial system into a political battlefield. But I'm here to tell you that Americans are waking up. They are waking up to this administration's assault on their retirement accounts. In this debate, one thing is clear. Companies have a decision to make. Will they stand by quietly and let bureaucrats in Washington drive up costs and regulatory burdens, ultimately harming their very everyday investors, 
Or will they stand up to the out-of-touch, unrealistic policies being pushed by this administration? Republicans will continue to stand with those investors saving for retirement and their desire to build a more secure future by developing policies that prioritize their returns, promote economic growth for all, enhance financial security, and safeguard our capital markets for all. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the debate. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Capital Markets, Mr. Sherman, for one minute. Under capitalism, if through the sweat of one's brow and frugality of one's spending, you accumulate capital, and you have the courage to invest it in the American economy, you become a shareholder. And under capitalism, the shareholders are entitled to the information they want, even if the Republican Party doesn't think they should have it. Shareholders should be in control, not managers who don't own the company and shareholders should be able to get the investment advice they want, even if it's advice on how to improve the world rather than earnings per share. For over 100 years, the followers of Leon Trotsky and the Socialist Workers' Party have waged war against this capitalist model. Today, elements of the Republican Party join them in that effort. Ronald Reagan would be ashamed. Gentleman yields back. Mm -hmm. we, today we welcome the testimony of uh, Mr. Ted Allen, Vice President of the Society for Corporate Governance, Mr. James Copeland, um, Senior Fellow and Director of the Manhattan Institute, Mr. Lawrence Cunningham, Special Counsel with the law firm Mayor Brown, uh, Mr. Benjamin uh, Zyker, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, the Honorable Keith Ellison, Minnesota's Attorney General, one of our former colleagues. Welcome back to the House. Uh, nice to see you again. Um, and Keith served from uh, 2006 to 18, six, uh, six terms in the House. So welcome back. Uh, good to see you. Uh, and we thank each of you for being here. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. And we'll now start with uh, uh, you, Mr. Allen, uh, for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and members of this committee. My name is Ted Allen from the Society for Corporate Governance. Our members include 3,700 uh, corporate secretaries and other governance professionals who collectively represent more than 1,000 public companies of almost every size and in industry across the United States. I'm here today to share our members' concerns about the shareholder proposal process, which is governed by SEC Rule 14AA. The original intent of Rule 1488, as explained by the SEC in 1945, was to enable shareholders to present proposals on, quote, matters relating to the affairs of the company, but not on matters related to, a, of a general political, social, or economic nature. Unfortunately, the SEC has strayed from this original intent and forced companies to include resolutions that relate to significant social policy issues. In November of 2021, the SEC issued Staff Legal Bulletin 14L, which further reduced the ability of public companies to exclude shareholder proposals uh, that address uh, significant public policy, uh, social policy issues, even if they didn't relate to the specific circumstances of, of a company. Uh, since that Staff Legal Bulletin was issued, there's been a notable increase in the number of uh, shareholder proposals filed. So far this year, there's been a record number of proposals filed, 961, up 18% from 2021. This increase has been driven primarily by activists pushing environmental and social objectives. These proposals accounted for 62% of all proposal filings so far this year. And the number of environmental and social proposals has soared by 52% since 2021. Many of these proposals are overly prescriptive or not linked to long-term shareholder value. Some resolutions raise contentious uh, policy issues, such as phasing out the use of fossil fuels, which would be more appropriately addressed by Congress or state lawmakers. Our members have been besieged by proposals from across the political spectrum. Some companies have faced competing demands on climate risk or diversity policies, while others must cope with proposals on abortion or other controversial topics. These politically inspired proposals have become an increasing burden on investors as, um, and companies. Um, but for companies, in a recent survey of society members, nearly half of respondents 
said managing shareholder proposals is a significant time commitment. While costs uh, vary by companies, some companies are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars each year to respond to the demand of investors who are only required to own a $2,000 stake for three years. These proposals also bear, uh, pose a significant burden for investors. Some institutional investors have told our members that they do not have enough time to read proxy statements in detail. Some institutions have hired additional staff, while others have increased their reliance on proxy advisory firms. In response to these trends, the society supports the following reforms. One, rescind staff legal bulletin 14L. Companies should not be obligated to include proposals that relate to ordinary business or are economically irrelevant. Two, eliminate the significant social policy issue exception under Rule 14A8. Companies should not be forced to take sides on political, on controversial social issues or provide over, preside over political debates at their shareholder meetings. Three, increase the economic thresholds for filing shareholder proposals. The current $2,000 requirement for long-term investors is not sufficient given the significant, uh, the substantial costs imposed on companies and other investors. Uh, four, provide meaningful oversight of proxy advisors. As detailed in my written testimony, proxy advisors have a significant influence over proxy voting outcomes. The society supports reforms that would promote uh, greater accuracy, transparency, and co completeness of proxy research. In particular, companies should have a reasonable opportunity to review proxy, uh, draft proxy reports for accuracy before investors start voting. Five, uh, we support limits on the use of automated proxy voting systems. The SEC should require clients of proxy advisory firms to verify they've received final research reports before their shares are voted. And finally, uh, the society supports the creation of a public company advisory committee of the SEC. Uh, public companies really have no voice at the SEC, um, except for when they're commenting on proposed rules. We think providing that voice prior to the proposal of rules would help uh, ensure a more balanced rulemaking process. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Copeland, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, members of the committee. I'd really like to thank you for the invitation to testify today. My name is James R. Copeland. Since 2003, I've been a scholar with the Manhattan Institute, where I'm a senior fellow and director of legal policy research. Although my comments draw upon such research conducted for my employer, my statement before the committee today is solely my own. I'm very pleased that this committee is tackling this issue in such an extensive way. I've been studying the shareholders' proposal process since before 2011, when under my leadership, the Manhattan Institute launched our proxy monitor database, which contains current and historical data on shareholder proposals introduced at America's largest publicly traded companies. I first oversaw empirical research into proxy advisory firms and wrote about their influence in the Wall Street Journal 11 years ago. I published research on the adverse economic impact of public pension funds, socially oriented shareholder activism eight years ago. And of course, seven years ago, I presented extensive testimony to a subcommittee of this body detailing the problems with proxy advisory firms and the shareholder proposal process and calling for reforms. So today's hearing is very welcome and a long time coming. In my limited time here today, I want to emphasize four key points. One, to an extent most Americans do not realize a very small number of actors exert enormous influence over almost all of our largest businesses. These actors are neither democratically elected representatives nor investing geniuses. Rather, we are talking about two relatively small, privately owned proxy advisory firms, ISS and Glass-Lewis, that oversee much of shareholder voting, and three large asset management fund families, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, that mostly make their money by passively tracking stock market indices, but play an extraordinarily large role in corporate governance. Two, this small oligarchy's influence is very much a function of our regulatory structure. Proxy advisory firms emerged in the wake of legal guidance given by federal regulatory agencies on institutional and pension voting. The shareholder proposal process itself is essentially mandated by the Securities and Exchange Commission, even though this body has not clearly authorized the agency to do so. 
As I detail in my written testimony, the SEC has effectively preempted state corporate law without congressional authorization, and it regularly compels controversial speech in violation of the First Amendment. Three, under this administration, the SEC and other regulators have aggressively been going beyond their statutory missions to promote environmental and social regulatory causes. They are effectively doing an end run around Congress to achieve, through executive rulemaking, policy goals that go beyond those endorsed by the legislature. The SEC has also recently altered its staff guidance in handling shareholder proposals, effectively doing an end run around the notice and comment rulemaking process mandated by Congress through the Administrative Procedure Act. The SEC's new position is that corporate annual meetings must permit the smallest of shareholders to force shareholder votes on any social or policy concerns, whether or not material to the company's business. Four, this change in policy has predictably led to a significant increase in socially oriented shareholder activism. In 2022, the first year after the SEC's new guidance, the number of shareholder proposals faced by the large companies tracked in our proxy monitor database jumped 33% over the prior three-year average. To date in 2023, with approximately 10% of companies yet to file a proxy statement, companies have already seen a record number of shareholder proposals. This increase has been driven principally by a large uptick in the filing of proposals relating to environmental, social, or policy issues. To date in 2023, Fortune 250 companies have considered 243 such proposals more than in 2022 and more than double the number seen in any of the prior three years. Indeed, for the second consecutive year, more than 60% of shareholder proposals at large companies have had a social or environmental focus, which has never before happened dating back to, 20, to, dating back to 2006, the first year covered by the Proxy Monitor database. Beyond these central concerns, I've submitted extensive written testimony into the record in addition to incorporating by reference a large number of my writings on the subject, and I'm happy to discuss these in more detail and to talk about suggested legislation in question and answer. Thanks again for including me in this hearing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cunningham. Chair McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Lawrence Cunningham, Special Counsel at Mayor Brown, and Emeritus Professor of George Washington University, though the comments I make today are my own. Having spent my 35-year career in the corporate field as a lawyer, a professor, a corporate director of public companies, and as the author of many popular investment titles, I have come to believe that congressional action is needed to strengthen the protection of investors because events have overtaken existing law. To see how, consider the changing landscape since I began my career. Back then, individual investors routinely owned stock directly in corporate America. 70% of public equity was owned by individuals and families. But today, most Americans invest through mutual funds and pension funds. Such asset managers now hold 70% of public equity on their behalf. Asset managers used to pick stocks by researching particular companies. But today, most index, meaning buying all the stocks in the market without much research. Managers used to vote by vote the shares by putting investor returns first, often by following a company's board recommendations. But indexers now use general formulas or defer to proxy advisors reducing the emphasis on returns. Back then, proxy advisors were policy wonks and didn't need any oversight or to have any duties, but today they are for-profit powerhouses, yet still without duties or oversight. Special interests have long tried to insert themselves into corporate governance for their own ends, but these changes have emboldened them to seize unprecedented power, harming American investors. Three topics need addressing to protect investors. First, the federal shareholder proposal rule, once used to improve corporate governance to protect investors, 
is attracting special interest in record numbers and reach to advance their goals at the expense of investors. While special interests have always tried to do so, state and federal law historically restricted them. But two years ago, the SEC staff began requiring companies to include special interest proposals of a social nature anytime the staff deems it significant. The results are far more proposals, far more boards being required to include those proposals against their fiduciary judgment. Shareholders, in turn, have been rejecting these proposals in, by record margins. This year, only 5% of proposals passed. The average support was a mere 25%. But special interests win publicity even when their proposals lose, subsidized by American investors. Another data point speaks volumes. This proxy season, more than half of all proposals were made by five parties. All these figures show that the production of shareholder proposals does not have widespread support in America. Second, those special interests are taking advantage of the rise of indexing, an ingenious investment strategy that involves buying all the stocks in a market, delivering the market turn, return with no risk. This popular strategy is now used by funds that manage half of American public equity. The genius of index investing is to avoid all the costs of research and, and to avoid having any particular risk. Um, the challenge, though, is then for those funds to figure out how to vote those shares. One solution, which many index funds used to use, would be to follow the recommendations of the company's fiduciary board. More recently, the largest funds began publishing guidelines about how they would vote, which are one-size-fits-all formulas that aren't really fit for many companies. And as social proposals proliferate, the guidelines now state views aligning with public uh, special interest groups rather than focusing on the economic rationales of the particular subject for the, com for the particular company and its shareholders. I'm honored to be here today. I'd be happy to uh, help the committee in any way that I can, and also happy to take your questions. Thank you. Uh, now we'll go to you, Mr. Uh, Zyker, um, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Both earlier and recent regulatory actions by the Securities and Exchange If you'll please pull the mic a little closer to you. Yeah, they're uh, quite sensitive. Have created a, a duopoly in the market for proxy advisory services and powerful incentives for firms and funds to re proxy advisors and to adopt their recommendations, often on an automatic basis. The advisors themselves have weak incentives to consider the fiduciary interests of shareholders and fund participants, thus freeing them to indulge their own political preferences at little or no cost to themselves. Unsurprisingly, environmental, social, and government's political objectives have come to influence proxy advice heavily. The resulting economic effects borne by shareholders and fund participants have been substantially negative and will increase in the absence of reforms driven by Congress. A conservative estimate is a decline in investment returns of two basis points per year. Other factors held constant and much greater adverse effects in the case of divestment pressures aimed at the fossil energy sector. This can surprise no one. ESG management and investment imperatives impose artificial constraints on management options and the components of investment portfolios and thus cannot be expected to yield positive investment impacts over time. For the economy and the aggregate, the impacts of this reduction in economic returns are substantial. A very simple analysis based upon wholly plausible assumptions implies that an ESG politicization of business management capital allocation would yield a decline in investment returns of uh, four-tenths of a percent over a 20-year period and a capital stock smaller by over 11 percent. Annual GDP would decline by $850 billion in annual labor compensation by more than 3 percent. Even if those effects are overstated by an order of magnitude, they still would be significant. Current proposals by financial regulators to force the private sector to implement climate policies in the form of measurement and reductions in greenhouse gas emissions 
would create severely adverse impacts while engendering climate effects literally equal to zero. The most prominent of these is the SEC proposed rule for the enhancement standardization of climate-related disclosures for investors mandating that public companies estimate their greenhouse gas emissions defined broadly and analyze the risks that their emissions might pose to their current and future investors. <clears throat> Such disclosures would not be material in particular because greenhouse gas emissions from a given firm, however broadly defined, cannot possibly have measurable climate effects and thus would have no impacts on prospective returns to investments in that firm. Moreover, no firm or industry is capable of analyzing the effects of greenhouse gas emissions on climate phenomena generally in, or in particular on a geographic or sectoral basis. Governments have never demonstrated an ability to do so. The uncertainties reported by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are staggering, and the climate system is so complex and so poorly understood that the IPIC climate models on average have overstated the actual satellite temperature record by a factor of about 2.5. The central impacts of the SEC proposal will be a vast increase in various kinds of litigation, efforts by firms subject to SEC rules to implement them in ways designed to avoid that litigation threat and the growth of a heavily parasitic uh, industry of consultants. A similar set of problems is attendant upon the high-level framework draft principles presented by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. I, I won't belabor that point right here. One reality, though, has been curiously absent in the public discussion. Climate policies as currently promoted politically would have effects virtually indistinguishable from zero. A good example is the Biden administration net zero proposal, which would, using the EPA climate model, reduce cl global temperatures in the year 2100 by 17 one hundredths of one degree. Um, I urge Congress not to focus on the large asset managers, uh, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. Their incentives are roughly efficient, however silly their public pronouncements. I urge Congress instead to reform the SEC regulatory framework. I urge Congress to enact legislation constraining the efforts of regulatory agencies to pursue climate policies not authorized in the law, uninformed by actual evidence, and justified on the basis of fundamentally dishonest benefit-cost analysis. Such, regu such regulatory efforts have and will continue to engender vast costs and no benefits. Congress must make it clear that only under new legislation can regulatory policies be expanded beyond the limits now authorized by statute. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We'll now go to you, Attorney General Ellison. Thank you for being here. Certainly, thank you, Chairman McHenry, and thank you, Ranking Member uh, Waters and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Keith Ellison, and I serve as Minnesota's Attorney General. I was on this committee for 12 years, as you pointed out, and it is certainly an honor to be back with you, and it's an honor to see all the new members. There are a number of new faces. Uh, as Attorney General, I serve on the governing board uh, of the Minnesota State Board of Investment. We call it the SBI. The SBI is a fiduciary for $125 billion in assets, serving more than 820,000 active and retired Minnesota public employees. Active public employees entrust us with a portion of their salaries in return for a secure investment. Public employers across the state and trust us with a portion of their balance sheets in return for a critical future benefit for their employees. I'm proud that the SBI pays out more than $5 billion a year in benefits to our members. In many cases, these benefits are the recipient's own uh, most important financial asset. One of our values is addressing environmental, social, and governance-related issues uh, and, and we know that they can and do lead to positive outcomes and add long-term value to our investments. Year over year, the Minnesota SBI is one of the highest performing public pension funds in America. ESG best practices and high market returns go hand in hand. Minnesota's public employees want us to invest wisely so their retirement is secure. As their fiduciaries, we have a duty to carefully consider all relevant investment risks and opportunities on their behalf. Their future is our portfolio. Indeed, it is the duty of fiduciaries 
in every sector to consider risks and opportunities that could impact their investments and their business. The private sector is now overwhelmingly considering ESG risk factors in investing. This is why 96% of the largest 250 global companies now issue a sustainability report. They don't do it out of the goodness of their hearts. They do it because it's good for business, shareholders, pensioners, and profits. ESG is nothing more than looking clear-eyed at risks and opportunities in the real world and making sound investment decisions on that basis. As Illinois State Treasurer Mike Friedrichs plainly stated in another congressional hearings, ESG is data, and data shows a positive correlation between ESG principles and returns on equity. Despite this data, in states across the country, there is a concerted attack on the freedom to invest. This attack is already leading to more costs and lower returns for business, pensioners, taxpayers. For example, according to an academic paper published by Wharton, free market, uh, anti-free market legislation may have cost taxpayers in Texas up to $532 million in higher interest rates and costs in just one year. According to Reuters, an unsustainable and anti, uh, an anti-sustainable investing bill in Indiana could cut state pension returns by 6.7 billion in 10 years. According to a publication, Institutional Investor, Kansas could lose up to 3.6 billion in the same time frame uh, based on a similar bill. But perhaps these bills are not about data. Perhaps they have nothing to do with ESG at all. Perhaps they're about running roughshod over the freedom to invest in order to protect one industry in particular, the fossil fuel industry the industry that bears so much responsibility by the costs of climate change and has waged a decades-long campaign of deception to deflect it. Prohibiting members, investors, and asset managers from considering ESG factors is interfering with the free market. Censoring relevant financial information is exactly what Congress should not be doing. Legislation that attempts to hijack the freedom to invest is a threat to the financial security of retirees and families in every state, including mine. Most Americans don't know what ESG means, but it's actually a bread and butter issue to anyone who wants to ignore ESG risk. I say bet your own money, but don't gamble with the Americans' life savings. I urge you to join me in standing up for Americans' freedom to invest and standing against anti-ESG bills that interfere with our freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I want to thank the panel for being here. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Mr. Copeland, um, last fall, the Supreme Court issued a decision uh, in the case known as West Virginia versus the EPA. Uh, the case is significant for a number of reasons, but particularly to the matters of the day, would you explain the Supreme Court's position regarding a federal agency's regulatory authority over significant policy matters? Uh, then I'd like to see how it applies to the, the matter at hand. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the West Virginia v. EPA uh, decision last year uh, formalized at the Supreme Court what we've seen in a number of other cases, uh, as well as in the appellate courts, what, what's commonly called the major questions doctrine, or at least that's what it's been called now. And the basic premise there is that uh, when it comes to big policy matters, this body, the Congress, makes the decision on where the legislation is supposed to go, uh, and, and not a regulatory agency unless Congress has spoken clearly and delegated uh, certain authorities to that agency. Now, there's some disagreement among the justices about what it means, and uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett articulated uh, a position in Biden v. Nebraska, the student loan case that just came down uh, at the end of last month, uh, saying that really this is just more common sense analysis of reading a statute. So. Um, if, if, if the statute's all talking about one thing and then the agency goes off in some other direction, you know, we're not going to read it that way unless the language is, is, is really clear that Congress is making that happen. So, that you so speak to that, that example of those two court cases and apply it to the specific matter today about the Securities and Exchange Commission's ability to require climate-related disclosures. Right. Well, as, as I said in the Wall Street Journal last summer, um, if, if the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is stepping out of bounds uh, in doing various sorts of, of climate regulations, which was what the Supreme Court uh, determined a year ago, clearly the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, 
which is about protecting investors so that they know what's going on in the companies they invest in uh, is going to be limited in, in, in what it can Now, has the SEC's position on climate disclosures changed? So, like, give an example of 2016 to today. Is yeah. there a difference? Well, I mean, in 2010, the SEC uh, came down with uh, rules on climate change disclosure, but they were narrowly focused to material uh, information, which really ought to be included anyway. In, 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 in disclosures. And then in 2016, uh, the, the SEC came out with a, a policy statement saying, uh, you know, this, this is really, the, the broad issue here is, is, is off limits. And then just last year, they sort of basically reversed course on that and they came out with uh, disclosure requirements uh, extending to vendors, uh, non-material information, board decision making, and all sorts of things. I filed a comment letter extensively to, to the so, commission. So let's speak to that. Mr. Cunningham, can you speak to the question of materiality and its import with securities disclosures historically? Yeah, it's a fundamental principle of the securities law of jurisprudence that the, the purpose of disclosure is to provide information that a reasonable investor would consider important in making an investment or voting decision. And that, that articulation is uh, of longstanding, the Supreme Court uh, vintage. Now, there are some small details within the securities framework that might be required that, that wouldn't satisfy that definition, but much of the bulk of the, the pending uh, climate disclosure rule dispenses with, with that constraint, and I think that's the, that's the concern. That so how does materiality benefit, this question of materiality, benefit the an average investor? Because investors will only be given information that it's useful to them in making their investment decisions. The, the real risk of the floodgates are, are, are overwhelming investors with abundant information they can't make sense of and they can't use. So the materiality threshold is really a good filter that's useful for them. Okay. So uh, is there a reason to deviate from that principle in light of climate or environmental concerns? No, I, and it's hard, hard to think of why an, an investor would care about trivial information or an avalanche of, of information that would drown them in, in useless detail. And I, I think that's the big concern. Okay. So thank you for your testimony. I want to uh, thank the panel and uh, we'll now recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Attorney General Ellison, I want to thank you for testifying uh, but also, I'd like to apologize. Uh, perhaps you thought you were returning uh, to a committee that you once served on, uh, the Committee on Financial Services, but that committee doesn't exist anymore. You're, we are now the Committee of Culture Wars. In order to shine light on what is fact and what isn't, I want to ask you a number of questions about the duties of fiduciaries. As you know, most Americans invest their funds in pension plans like CalSTRS or the Minnesota State Retirement System or in mutual funds. These pension plans, mutual funds and others, are required by law to act as fiduciaries and work in the best interests of investors. So Attorney General Ellison, I'd like to ask you a series of yes or no questions about how a fiduciary evaluates the investments they make on behalf of their beneficiaries. Is it true that a fiduciary's main responsibility is to secure the strongest possible risk-adjusted returns for their investors or beneficiaries? Yes, ma'am. If a company has significant assets exposed to physical risk, for example, manufacturing facilities that are in an area that experiences frequent hurricanes and sea level rise, would a fiduciary be within their duties to consider that risk? I think it would be their duty. If a company's core product poses significant risk to human health as a result, foreseeable liability risk to the manufacturer, would a fiduciary be within their duties to consider that risk? Absolutely. Let's say a fiduciary has reason to believe that a company's internal accounting controls and independent board oversight are severely deficient. Do you think the fiduciary should be permitted to offer a shareholder proposal on behalf of their beneficiaries 
at a company's annual meeting urging that company to improve its controls and oversight. Yes, it would be expected. Now, there is a bill that has been noticed for this hearing that would prohibit making proposals like this because they are, quote, governance related. Do you think it serves the interests of investors to prohibit such proposals? No, ma'am, I don't think they do. Attorney General, Republicans have labeled any program they don't like as socialists, from Medicare to Social Security. But it seems to me that by trying to block the owners of capital, investors, and their chosen fiduciaries from exercising their rights and from trying to make money, Republicans may need a lesson on how capitalism actually works. What do you think, Mr. Ellison? Well, I think that risk-adjusted uh, factors and considerations uh, are important to advance the best interests of the beneficiaries of the pension fund that I sit on, and I want to know all the information. Uh, and certainly, um, there are numerous examples of how ESG factors would benefit those beneficiaries. And in fact, they demand it. They ask us to factor in those risk factors. Thank you, Ms. Ellison. I want to turn to private funds. Today, private equity funds hold approximately $7 trillion, and venture capital funds hold $1 trillion. However, they are not required to disclose their investments in women and minority-owned businesses or in companies that evaluate environmental, social, and governance factors. These private funds nowadays play an indispensable role in our economy. Private equity and other private funds are involved in mergers and acquisitions, lending and restructuring of huge companies. Venture capital funds provide funding to startups and early stage companies. This lack of private fund transparency makes it difficult for investors like pension plans to value the fund, including by understanding the fund's investments in women-owned, diverse-owned businesses and businesses that promote diversity, equity, and sustainability. What are your views on the lack of transparency as it relates to private funds? How could we achieve the types of transparency, accountability, and really sustainable future we want to achieve without increasing our understanding of the investment policies and practices of private funds? I think groupthink is uh, dangerous uh, for corporate governance. I think groupthink leads to uh, not considering factors that impact the company. And so we need diversity, we need different perspectives in order to have a company that can factor in everything that impinges upon the bottom line uh, for whether investors or beneficiaries of a pension fund. So we need, we need to factor it all in. Gentle lady's time's expired. Thank you. Yield back. Thank uh, you. Gentle lady yields back. We'll now go to the gentleman from Arkansas, the vice chair of the full committee, Mr. Hill, for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I commend uh, you and the task force and our capital market subcommittee for the good work in this excellent panel. Uh, Professor Cunningham, great to see you. I've read all of your books, so I recommend them, and there's no need to send me a fee for that. I just think if you're interested in investment practices, governance, or corporate finance, you need to read Larry Cunningham. And terrific to see my good friend, uh, Attorney General Ellison, back at our committee. Likewise. Uh, these days, it seems like our SEC is more the Securities and Environment Commission instead of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And we need to think long and hard about that because the commission under its current leadership wants America's to become America's green regulator because there's not consensus legislatively about how to fully address climate. And mandating ESG disclosures for public and private companies, in my view, is drifting far from the statutory mission of the commission. Let me be clear, I have no problem if a company wants to make climate or other ESG disclosures, they're perfectly in their rights to do that. In fact, as a former private and public company director and C-suite executive, they've got a statutory and a fiduciary responsibility to do that right now under current law to make sure that the investment community understands their strategies that have a outstanding human resources policy, supply chain, resiliency, and capital allocation. So if ESG factors are material to that investment decision, our law covers that today. No regulatory mandate is necessary. And to my good friend from Minnesota, I don't believe that anyone's proposing to ignore ESG to their peril, I think was your quote. In fact, 
We're for crafting practical, effective, cost-effective, particularly responses driven by those market participants. Uh, Mr. Ellison, you know, if a publicly traded company spends an insignificant amount of money on electricity, let's say, it's kind of hard to think about that. I'm just picking a hypothetical example. I know lawyers don't like hypothetical examples. Should, you know, and as they consider disclosing it, if it's not material to them, is that really something they should spend a lot of time on? I mean, it's that practical aspect of materiality. If something's not material, then it need not be considered. But so often, ESG considerations are material. Mm -hmm. But so I think, when, don't you think that fiduciary statutory obligation of that C-suite and that board is there now to make that determination as opposed to it being literally a mandate across the board for every public and private company, one size fits all? I mean, really? Well, it, let's go back to 2008. You know, uh, we had the, we had the, the, the mortgage crisis. Yep. I think part of why we got into that crisis is that we did not have enough people thinking about the 360 degree risks yeah. that were attended. Fair point. I don't want to take up my time uh, doing that, but I do want to thank you for our work together on credit inclusion. Absolutely. And uh, we did that bill together during Mr. Hensrling's chairmanship to add additional data for rental payments and utility payments to let more people have access to credit. You still like that idea? Yes. Good. Uh, Mr. Allen, excellent testimony, fantastic list of recommendations. Can you uh, talk about the potential consequences if the SEC were to require companies to disclose non-material climate information? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I think the biggest um, consequence would be, well, several consequences. There would be first uh, significant costs imposed on public companies. Uh, to, uh, in our three comment letters to the SEC, we detail our members' cost concerns. I think another concern, and I think you alluded to this earlier, is the impact on, comp on private companies, small businesses, minority-owned businesses within companies' supply chains. Yeah, under the yeah we can't, I mean, I hear from businesses all the time, they can't comply with the conflict mineral rule now, uh, technically, all the way down the supply chain. How could they do, is, what, could they really be able to do this? Scope no, three. I, Scope I, three. Is that realistic? No, I think a lot of these um, smaller ventures, these these you know local firms, farmers and and others would be unable to to beat this burden. Let me let me switch gears, Mr. Copeland. Um, you know, in this committee and in our executive branch, we typically push back about extraterritorial things that we think hurt American performance, American systems, where you know some Europeans don't understand that we're organized a little differently here. Uh, what are your concerns about the potential impact and cost to U.S. businesses from this European set of mandates that they plan on imposing on U.S. business? I, I'm very concerned with it. I think this committee should be and this, this Congress should be. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, what, what they're talking about doing in Europe is uh, creating a, a, a form of climate disclosure regulation uh, that applies not only to subsidiaries of American companies operating in Europe, but to the parent companies themselves. So they're going to thank you. My time's expired. I yield back. But let's—if you have more, would you please respond in writing on that question? Thank you. Yield back. We'll now go to the uh, ranking member of the Capital Markets Subcommittee, Mr. Shermer of California, for five minutes. I agree with the gentleman from Arkansas that these additional disclosures that so many investors want are difficult to design. It took over 200 years for the accounting profession to define and provide systems to tabulate, audit, and report the information on the balance sheet, the income statement. And uh, I think sometimes in our fervor to give people information that they want about the environment, we o o overlook how difficult it will be for that information to be comparable, tabulatable, and audible. What shocks me is that 20 years ago, it was more folks on the conservative side that wanted shareholders to be able to make decisions based on something other than earnings per share and shut up and do whatever the corporate board wants. In this room 20 years ago, we passed legislation to allow shareholders uh, and, and pension plans to divest from companies that were helping Iran's economy at a time when it was building nuclear weapons. And today, many conservatives would divest their uh, uh, stock holdings in a company that was about to transfer 
technical uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, technology to China. Um, we're told by some that materiality is 5% of earnings. But I think Mr. Cunningham was correct in telling us that materiality is what an in a reasonable investor thinks is important. And some people think the environment is important. Some people think whether the Chinese Communist Party gets the most technical uh, AI information is important. Um, uh, Mr. Cunningham tells us that we should let the states decide. That is a race to the bottom so that we, it, it's kind of democracy, phony democracy, kind of a Putin's democracy. One vote, one, one person, one vote, one time. You elect a board, then they're in total control. They go to Delaware and they'll agree to pay some fees as long as you give them rules that make it clear that the shareholders can't tell the board what to do. And then if Delaware won't do that, you go to Wyoming. If Wyoming won't do that, you go to North Dakota. If we're going to have shareholder democracy, it needs to be protected uh, by the SEC. Uh, Mr. Ellison, welcome back. Good to um, be back. And, you know, you deal with conservatorships, guardianships in the state of Minnesota. If somebody is incompetent to deal with their money, uh, Many, you know, a conservator's appointed. Um, would, now, look, if somebody wanted to spend their money buying bad art or Yankee season tickets, maybe they, a conservator should be appointed because they're wasting their money on something totally unreasonable. Um, would somebody, would, would, would an investor be deprived of their a right to decide how to invest simply because they cared about, say, the environment? I certainly don't think so. I think it gives them freedom to invest. And would they be, would you take away their right to invest if they didn't want to invest in a company that was transferring te uh, highly sensitive technology to China? I don't think we'd take away their right to invest. But how would you have a right to invest on this basis or that basis if you didn't get the information that you wanted? Now, not, and I don't want to point out, there might be some peculiar investor who cares how many buildings are painted purple. And we don't have time to tell them. But the reason for this hearing is not because investors won't vote for these resolutions. It's because they will. And 5% of the time they do. And 25% of them vote for them. This is the reason for this hearing is to blind investors to the information they want. So is there any meaningful way for an intelligent investor to decide to invest on the basis of impact on the environment if we don't allow the investor to have that information, Mr. Ellison? I don't know how you can make an intelligent decision about an investment if you don't have the information. In fact, Perhaps the only thing that would be crazy is in trying to invest for the environment in a society that deprives you of all information about how your investments are affecting the environment. Um, let, uh, I, uh, let's see. Um, and finally, is uh, Vanguard, uh, uh, my time has expired. <clears throat> Gentleman yields back. Uh, with that, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, Mr. Ellison. Welcome back. Good to see you. Likewise, thank you. The uh, marketplace has been reacting uh, strongly to its viewpoints about people making decisions in the marketplace and how consumers uh, react to that. And I find it very interesting that it's important for us, interesting and important that, that Mr. Ellison wanted his state to make the decisions that they made. I respect that. Mr. Copeland, however, it has become apparent to me and other members, I think, of this committee that you'll hear today that we believe the SEC as a government institution is abusing the discretion delegated to it. It's not the customer, it is the oversight 
And we believe that this discretion that is delegated by Congress is using it to undermine and even destroy disfavored industries and companies that don't align with what is a political agenda of the current administration, particularly in this case of exercise of investigatory discretion. Could you please talk with me and this committee on how a case could be made for abuse of its congressionally designated discretion at the SEC could be made based on existing evidence around its implementation of social policy in financial regulations and what we in Congress should do about that? Absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think as I, as I alluded to in my testimony, they've been doing end runs in, in a variety of ways. Uh, so uh, the, the colloquy I had with the, the chairman briefly on um, sort of major questions is, is, is part of the issue here. The, the, the SEC was created in, in, the, in the 1930s, uh, and our securities regulatory regime created in the 33 and 34 Act. And the principle of that is to Put disclosure out there so that investors can, can know uh, what's happening with the companies, so that we can have a robust publicly traded stock market. And that generally has worked well. Um, it's not to engage in substantive policy making. And so this, this sort of end run around Congress going into environmental issues particularly, and, and again, I want to emphasize, the, the interpretive guidance that the SEC gave in 2010, I'm on record as saying is reasonable. Material uh, information is reasonable to, to have a disclosure for, and I was pleased to see the Attorney General say that this information ought to be material, because that's not what they did uh, last year uh, in, in the proposed rule that's still pending before the SEC on climate disclosure. So the other thing we've seen, and this is sort of, it's, it's not just the rulemaking process, they're actually end running the rulemaking process, and this is what they did in November of 2021. Uh, with, with the staff guidance letter 14L, and, and in, in that move, they basically said, well, anything, even if it's not material, if it's a matter of, of public concern or social concern, we're going to allow it on the ballot. Now, as I, I document in my written testimony, this is an exact inversion of the old rule, uh, which allowed such proposals to be excluded from ballots, and that was the rule until the 1970s when the SEC completely flipped its position on its head. Uh, but, but, you know, this, this is very problematic. Uh, this is, what we're doing is the, the regulator is exceeding what Congress has said it can do, and it's, it's trying to achieve a policy goal, and it's not limited to just the SEC, right? I mean, we've seen the same thing from the Federal Reserve, the Office of Comptroller of the Currency, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is something that we've seen across financial regulators in this administration. Well, I, I agree with you. I also agree that uh, if Mr. Ellison or his state as a consumer, customer, uh, investor wanted to make that decision, then they would make that decision about seeking someone who would give them more information. I'm concerned about the overreach of government regulators, as you just expressed, about how they use the discretionary powers that they have to drive down political instruction and decisions. And I find it very interesting that we were accused in the very beginning of this hearing of driving a political agenda. <laughs> we know who the political agenda is because free markets like to make their own decisions. And people who are investors like to invest in the things that will gain them what they're after. And when it's driven by government, I think we make a mistake. I want to thank each of you for being here today. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, let me just tell you, I have some concerns about the proposals of emissions disclosure, or what we call scope three, what it will have and what it imposes on our small family farmers and ranchers. I don't know if you all know this or not, but 98% of all our farms in the United States are independent family-owned operations that do not have the financial resources to track and report the emissions data necessary 
to meet the scope three disclosure requirement. Do you do you realize that? So, Mr. Zacker, I hope I pronounce your name correctly. That, Is that's it? fine, Congressman. Yes, thank you. Uh, my understanding is that for large companies that meet the reporting requirements, the rule does not require them to collect precise emissions data for farms and ranches or any business from which they source. So, if enacted, could a publicly traded company still choose to seek data from small farms or agriculture suppliers if it wanted to? Oh, I, I, and I, also, under what circumstances could we see this happening? Well, a firm can seek to acquire information from anyone it chooses, whether the recipient of that request is legally required to provide it is a different question. Um, I, I am not sure about the answer to that question with respect to the agriculture, the small agricultural sector. Uh, Jim Copeland may, may know the answer to that. I do not. What about then, what about large publicly traded banks or other financial institutions who provide loans to small farmers and ranchers. Yeah, the, Could uh, scope three requirements have an unintended consequence on the amount of loans or investment activity is made by banks? Well, the, the Fed's draft principles, uh, if I recall correctly, do not break out uh, scope one, two, and three emissions um, information gathering requirements, they require large financial institutions to estimate their climate risks, which are not very well defined. And the problem is that the estimation of those risks depends heavily on the choice of climate model, the choice among a myriad of assumptions, and all the rest, and the, the combinations and permutations of models and assumptions and the rest um, uh, is very, very unlikely to provide useful information for financial regulators, but would be very expensive for the financial institutions themselves and would create new litigation risks that are not to be ignored. Well, let me just say that I hope that uh, Mr. Gensler, uh would not implement this Scope 3 situation. I think we need to carefully look at the impact it has in our agriculture community. A recent New York Times article uh, did some research, and do you know, we're losing 1,700 small farmers and ranchers every year. We're losing, and we need to carefully look at this impact that this could have on our agriculture system, especially our small farmers and ranchers. And I trust that Chairman Gensler does not intend for the SEC to capture the emissions data of every farmer or rancher in the supply chain. So my hope is that he will continue to review feedback on the scope three emissions and make the appropriate changes before any rule is finalized. Thank you, Chairman. Gentlemen's time has ex expired. Uh, the gentleman from Missouri, the uh, chair of the National Security Subcommittee, Mr. Luca Myers, now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome all of you. Uh, Mr. Ellison, welcome back. Uh, Mr. Zeicher, in your testimony you emphasized the significance of climate policy and its impact on capital allocation. To me, this seems like the sky's version of Operation Choke Point, where regulators are picking and choosing what industries have access to banking services, including access to financing. Can you explain how regulatory attempts to impose uh, climate policies on the private sector can affect 
investment decisions and economic performance? Yeah, such regulatory efforts, uh, particularly aimed at the fossil energy industry and others as well, uh, would have the effect of distorting capital allocation by distorting investment <clears throat> decisions, lending decisions, and all the rest. And as I discussed briefly in my oral statement and more extensively in my, in my prepared statement, the, the aggregate effect would be a, a less valuable capital stock producing a less valuable basket of goods and services, a smaller economy, uh, less labor productivity, less employment, lower wages. Uh, there, there's simply nothing to be gained uh, regardless of what you believe about the existence or severity of a, of a reported climate crisis, these initiatives cannot possibly have any effect on climate phenomena, let's say by the end of, of the century. And so they really do represent all costs and no benefit. Thank you. Um, one of the concerns I've got is the fiduciary responsibility of these investment groups, whether it's BlackRock or State Street or Vanguard or any other entities, big banks, whatever. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things uh, it says, one of the comments I, I see here in, in some of the stuff I've been reading here is that corporate boardrooms are not, have been turned into partisan platforms where political agendas overshadow sound financial management. I think um, in one of the articles here that we've pulled from Forbes uh, about a year ago, I talked like a 14% decrease in the valuation of these companies. Uh, Mr. Zeicher, in your testimony, you talk about ESG funds lagging behind other funds by two basis points per year. So <clears throat> my comment is, uh, or my concern is, I guess, there's a fiduciary responsibility that these companies have for um, administering these funds. And Mr. Cunningham, Mr. Copeland, Mr. Alley, and one of you want to, to answer the question. But it seems like to me like they've opened themselves up to a really big problem unless they're totally disclosing the fact that ESG investment does not make more money, does not give you a better return. Uh, but if there's an agenda here that's being forced on them from outside, uh, does, does that, it needs to be disclosed and, and investors need to know that you can expect less returns. Is that a fair comment, Mr. Cunningham? Well, I do think that uh, special interest groups have assert, asserted themselves and have um, pressured a lot of funds to elevate the priority of, of ESG. I, I think many funds, there's evidence that indicates that funds have um, believed that they get some private advantage from presenting themselves that way. Well, even even Mr. Fink the other day with BlackRock made the comment that he was ashamed about his, his investment policy with, with regards to ESG. So, I mean, they're, they're starting to, I think Vanguard has proved that, pulled out of the net zero. Uh, over in Europe, so they're, they're beginning to understand that there's a concern. And so my point is, they have a fiduciary responsibility to the people that they're investing this money for. Are they showing this? Are they disclosing this? Are you aware of this? Such that it, they can keep themselves from being sued. Yeah, it, it, it's commonly said that following ESG practices is good for the long-term economic interests of a company or, or of a fund, but, but the empirical evidence doesn't support that assertion. I'm, I'm sure the people believe it's true, but, but the data don't bear it out. Um, there are some evidence that there's a correlation between certain practices uh, and certain outcomes, like certain board compositions and corporate performance, but scant evidence of any causation. Um, and, and incidentally, a lot of proponents of these shareholder proposals don't even uh, provide that rationalization uh, under the SEC's current approach. They're allowed to require companies to put in proposals on, on any socially significant topic. So I think you've, you've pinpointed a, a very serious um, problem for the funds. I think, I think they recognize the problem and they're, they're struggling to, uh, to resolve it. Well, I think Mr. Fink's comment makes that point. And I, I just have one other comment here, and it's just a comment. I think, Mr. Copeland, you made the comment with regards to laws and rules and guidance. And I'm very concerned that the SEC uses guidance, kind of like what the, the, the CFPB does, to try and scare, bully, and intimidate people in doing things when the guidance does not have the force of law. Gentleman's uh, time has expired. I yield back. Uh, with that, the gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Lynch, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member, for holding this hearing. Uh, Attorney General Ellison, it's wonderful to see you, my friend. Likewise. It's been a while. Uh, and uh, 
So, so as you know, Keith, uh, prior to coming to Congress, I was an iron worker for about 20 years. I actually worked at the uh, Framingham uh, General Motors facility uh, in Framingham, Massachusetts. Uh, worked at the general uh, worked at the General Dynamics shipyard at, down in Quincy, and uh, around the same time in the 80s, uh, General Motors, which was focused on shareholder value, singularly, uh, decided to close the General Motors plant in Framingham, close one in Michigan as well, and open up two plants in Mexico because they were. It was focused on shareholder value. So uh, I know that in both those communities where the plants closed down in the United States, it was devastating. It was devastating. Even today, I mean, there were, I think, 2,300 workers. It was three shifts uh, in, in Framingham. Uh, it devastated that area for a long time, and only recently have they recovered after all this time. Same, same thing in Michigan. And, you know, General Motors did that to maximize shareholder value by exploiting. They, they went from a union workforce in the United States to a non-union workforce in Mexico, in the Maquiladoras. They also had almost no, at that time, almost no environmental laws in Mexico that would, would prevent them from basically, you know, exploiting the, the, the land there. So, in, in that case, in that case, the, the ESG considerations, uh, environmental impact on, on, on Mexico, the, the social impact of the communities here in the United States were completely ignored while, you know, General Motors uh, relocated those plants and those jobs to Mexico. If, if ESG had been in play at that time, if if the impact on the local communities had been considered in that decision, I mean, could that, could all this offshoring, you know, companies moving their jobs to China to maximize, you know, uh, shareholder value, I mean, could you see or, or can you envision and in your role as, as the chief law enforcement officer in the state of Minnesota, can you see how ESG could could benefit and, and uh, inform some of those decisions? I think it's, thank you, uh, Congressman. It's great to see you too and everyone. I, I think it's important to point out that ESG, as we apply it in the Minnesota SBI, is not a mandate. It's not like you must only do ESG and can't do anything else. It is what we ask our portfolio manager to consider and I think it would only be of benefit to consider the impact on workers and communities. Moving a plant to a foreign country may will impact supply chains. Something happens there, you have less control over it. You may have less quality assurance, not for certain, but it's certainly something to consider. I mean, you may have uh, child labor. I mean, maybe it is cheaper and it can drive up your bottom line to use a 13-year-old to, to, to clean a kill floor in a meatpacking plant, but maybe that is uh, so outside of our value system that it's something that we won't do, even if it will make somebody a few more bucks, right? So I mean, I think that these things are to be considered. They should be factored in. Uh, and uh, the way we apply our ESG policy uh, is that we have a, a robust, diverse conversation uh, and want these values considered. So at least somebody can raise the issue that you raise. At least somebody can say, hey, what about this? Uh, that is what we do with our ESG policy. That's great. I know that, uh, I know that President Biden has uh, two reasons that he, he, he supported and, 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 and uh, signed the CHIPS Act. Uh, number one, uh, all this chip manufacturing had migrated from, from our country, uh, mostly to Taiwan, but other countries as well. So there was a, a national security issue. But he also relocated those plants in the Midwest, where there, were high there was high unemployment and continues today. So uh, you know, I can see where the president's uh, adherence to ESG principles has, uh, has benefited the workers in the Midwest. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your indulgence.
Uh, gentlemen, uh, time has expired. The gentleman yields back, and I recognize myself for, uh, for five minutes. I want to say thank you to witnesses for being here. Mr. Ellis, uh, thanks for being back again. Uh, I've got a lot of cover, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, Mr. Copeland, the SEC's legal mandate includes directives to protect investors, facilitate capital formation, and promote efficient markets. How does the dominance of social and policy issues in corporate annual meetings conflict with these objectives? I think it's generally in tension with them, and the SEC is, is you Sorry, did you say intentional? In, in tension with them, excuse yeah. me. So I think it, it, there's a conflict yes. there, and, yep. and, and, and this Congress has expressly put on the SEC those words, competition, efficient markets, capital formation, that, that, that don't apply uh, in terms of rulemaking and all the other agencies. Uh, beyond the direct costs, what are the costs incurred by companies in responding to all of these shareholder proposals focused on social or policy issues? Uh, there was a study that said 67%, or I believe it was 61% of all uh, uh, all proposals were ESG-focused last year, which was a two-fold increase. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the important question, because the direct costs for the large companies are relatively small uh, in terms of how to respond, but the indirect costs are huge. The most valuable thing for your board of directors and for your chief executive C-suite officers is their time, and they have to focus a lot of time on these shareholder proposals that get put on their ballot every year at all these annual meetings. And, and very, very few large companies become public, right? I mean, they tend to be smaller companies, so would you view this as a detriment to companies going public? Absolutely. I mean, when I first testified in front of the subcommittee of this body in 2006, we were talking about the capital markets, and that the number of publicly listed companies uh, is less than half today what it was in the mid-90s at the peak, yeah. and this is one of the reasons. Yeah. What are the costs to shareholders and consumers who primarily are focused on financial performance and long-term value creation? Well, it hurts their returns. We did a study on this. Uh, Tracy Weidke at the University of Tennessee, uh, an economist, looked at the cost of, of socially uh, activist, uh, shareholder proposal activism uh, from public pension funds, and we saw, saw a negative correlation. Uh, this, was, this was, we did this eight years ago, a negative correlation between that sort of activity and share valuation at the company. So at the end of the day, uh, if you're investing your retirement in your pension, you're hurt by this activity. It hurts too. investors. Okay, thank you. Uh, at the beginning of this Congress, Chairman McHenry and myself, uh, Senator Tim Scott, uh, we all sent a, uh, a uh, letter to uh, Chair Ginsler at the SEC requesting documents and information on the climate disclosure rule. To date, we have largely, largely received publicly available information and precious little actual uh, information that has, uh, has answered any of those questions. Uh, in other words, the Commission has stonewalled Congress. Uh, Mr. Allen, can you speak to uh, potential consequences if the SEC were requiring uh, were to require companies to disclose non-material climate information. How might this affect investor decision-making and the overall efficiency and capital formation of the market? And again, the emphasis is on non-material. Yeah, no, we, we think it'll have a, a significant impact, a negative impact on investors. I mean, investors already are overloaded with a lot of information, even that that is material, and it's difficult for them to parse through and identify what information is, is most useful for them. And if there's a split of non-material information, particularly you know, information related to emissions that is not material for a particular company, you know, that's just gonna further uh, burden investors and make it more difficult for them to make effective buy-sell decisions. Um, the Supreme Court you know, had it right when it looked at the reasonable investor and the importance of materiality, and there's no reason for the SEC to, to depart from that standard. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Zyker, I want to address a couple of things uh, to you. Um, the climate rule attempts to assess the cost of the new disclosure requirements to individual business, but does not address the potential for increased energy costs more broadly to society. We've asked for this information, uh, how it could potentially raise energy costs, but uh, it's been very limited and no actual underlying analysis, which is what we were asking for. Um, the, it does say on page 401 of the proposed rule that it could cost uh, energy or cause energy costs to go up. Are you aware of any analysis conducted by the SEC on the proposed uh, rules impact on energy prices? And do you agree it would be prudent to better understand those costs before proceeding? Yeah, no, I've not um, seen any analysis from the SEC staff or, or, or any other uh, organization working with them 
on the effect of the proposal on energy prices. That's because they won't give the parameters for anybody else to do the analysis. Well, yeah, I, I just have not seen anything like that. Okay. Um, the problem is that there are two different components. My, One my is time, so unfortunately, my time has expired, but uh, I will follow up and love to get your written answer. Uh, with that, a uh, gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Uh, General Ellison, uh, welcome back. Um, after 18 Thank years, you. I made it up on, on the top level with the chair. Oh, well, I'm, I'm so proud of myself. Uh, we, we, we lingered down on that level for, for years together. Uh, but it's good to, to, to see you here and, and uh, appreciate your, your work uh, in your uh, state. Um, I, I'm, I'm always worried about having a dichotomous uh, discussion on uh, climate change and uh, because it, what it tends to do, um, it, it further, if, 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 if further can be used here, further divides uh, and, and damages our ability to, to solve uh, problems. And we do have a problem uh, and we should be concentrating from my perspective, on how we deal uh, with this uh, issue. Uh, you know, in 2019, Phoenix had 103 days, 103 days above 100 degrees. It's a fact. And we are arguing here primarily because this is argument heaven. And so, you know, we, 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 we spend a lot of money to come to Washington to argue, uh, run TV commercials to get to Washington to argue. It would be such more, much more productive if we were in here talking about, you know, how we deal with this uh, issue. Um, because it's, it's, not a, it's not a question of whether it's going to happen. It already is happening. And, uh, we, we're going to have to deal with it, and uh, we, we, we're going to all have to get deal with it, including uh, companies. Um, the only question is how bad it's going to to be, and 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 which areas are going to suffer the most. Uh, for many uh, companies, corporations, extreme weather events, or even slight changes in regional weather patterns can affect their operating performance. This is especially true for insurance companies and also for companies that are focused on specific geographic regions. Some companies already include general disclosure about climate risk, but those disclosures are typically vague and don't provide investors with a good sense of the scale uh, of the risk the companies face, uh, will face in climate change. What potential financial benefits uh, there are to uh, uh, are there to a company and disclosing financial and business risk. Um, and so uh, I, I, what I'm hoping, uh, uh, General Ellison, uh, is that you, you can at least uh, push us in the direction of how companies uh, uh, can comply with ESG policies uh, and still make uh, progress and make pro a, a profit. Uh, it's not one or the other, we can make both. Well, certainly you're right, uh, Congressman. Um, in Minnesota, we don't view uh, consideration of ESG, ESG factors as um, an intention uh, with risk-adjusted uh, rate of return um, priority. We see it as something that we have to do to be careful, and it's not just environmental. So there are there are also social and and governance factors which need to be brought into consideration. Uh, you know, uh, the research we've turned up shows that a my do more diverse board of directors actually is consistent with a more profitable firm because we break out of this groupthink model that um, sometimes undermines uh, the ability to assess risk. So I, our experience in Minnesota, we've had a very successful State Board of Investment, and we do we we uh, prize our ESG risk consideration and think it's important to how we do business. Again, we don't lock ourselves in. Not every single decision is to favor some ESG fund 
uh, we're flexible, but uh, I think you're absolutely right that uh, to not look at these uh, factors uh, would be to put blindfolds on. And to uh, take a look at these factors would be to put a, a, a uh, you know, either a microscope or certainly a uh, magnifying glass on a, on a serious problem which impacts the pensioners who are, yes. we are responsible for. I wish I had time to have somebody answer the question about uh, whether or not uh, crisis creates innovation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you're welcome. The gentleman's time has expired. With that, uh, the gentlelady from uh, Missouri, Ms. Wagner, who is the chair of the Capital Markets Subcommittee. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank all of our witnesses for being here. General Ellison, it's good to see you again. I appreciate the work that we've done together on uh, finding this, fighting the scourge of human trafficking and especially online sex trafficking. So Absolutely. I appreciate it your continued uh, efforts on that. Mr. Copeland, uh, under SEC Chair Gensler's leadership, uh, the number of environmental and social shareholder proposals has increased dramatically. Uh, the shareholder proposal process, which has played a key role in meaningful corporate governance for decades, is being eroded by a minority influence over America's public companies at the expense of everyday average investors. If the reforms proposed today are not enacted, what will be the long-term consequences for retail investors? I, they're gonna get a weaker return. So, right, I mean, there's two big problems here, as I see it. One, uh, you're gonna hurt the returns for the average investor. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes it more difficult for companies to, to run their business when you convert them into political platforms. The SEC long understood this. I mean, I argue my written testimony, the, the, the 14A shareholder proposal process is legally dubious to begin with based on what Congress has authorized the commission to do and based on the, the presumptive uh, state law, which is not a race to the bottom, as, as, as Representative Sherman said. It's a race to the top, as yes. Chief Judge Winter argued in his seminal 1977 argue, uh, article. I, I clerked for him, and, and it's the most important corporate law article of the last 50 years. But, mm. um, you know, I argue that there's a problem with it anyway, but, but, but at least if you're taking these social things off the table and we're talking about whether we elect all our directors annually or how we elect our directors, you're talking about real governance issues that involve the corporation and not these environmental and social concerns. So, I, yeah, that's that's the real cost. The other cost is is the cost of democracy itself, right? And that's why I wanted to emphasize that you've got two small proxy advisory firms privately owned, right? And 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 asset managers that are principally passive index investing vehicles, not making affirmative buy sell decisions, telling corporate America how to do their jobs, and that's an end run around the representative process. If everyone in Congress will be really concerned about that in both parties. And 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 to, to your initial point too, sir, there are millions of Americans who invest. They're hard-earned dollars uh, with the simple goal of achieving the highest return on their investment. Mr. Cunningham, uh, based on your decades of experience, sir, in what ways can the shareholder process, proposal process be restored to better protect the economic inter interests of, of what I care about most, retail investors? Well, thank you for the opportunity to, to make some suggestions. I think many of the bills that you're considering would, would do so. I think we... We need to um, eliminate or filter out the special interest groups from hijacking the shareholder proposal process. And, and as Mr. Copeland just said, it's been a very useful mechanism through which to improve fundamental governance practices in the country for 30 or 40 years. And, and, and that is the, the real legitimate and genuine purpose um, to respect state law prerogatives in that space. So any rulemaking that you can do um, or that the SEC could do to return it to focus on the corporation's interest, the shareholder's interest, and to filter out the, the special interest infiltration would be very useful. And, and their fiduciary responsibilities. Um, Mr. Allen, how have proxy advisor errors, analytical flaws, and omissions been documented and reported by stakeholders, including the society and its members? I mean, it's certainly a major concern for our, for our members. We did a, a member survey in 2019, and uh, it found that 42% of our um, members reported or uh, noticed errors in their proxy research, you know, about their companies within 42%? the past. 42%? 42%. And, you know, it was an astounding figure. We provided examples of 
those errors to the SEC in our comment letters in 2020 and 2021. So it's certainly something that, you know, errors, you know, are bound to occur given the number of, of companies that company, the proxy advisors are opining on. That's why we support a, a robust draft review process so companies have a reasonable opportunity to review draft reports before their investors start voting on when, them. When presented with these errors, how, how have the proxy advisors responded? Well, in some cases, they do make uh, corrections. In other cases, they will say, well, the, area, the error is not material, or they'll say it's a difference of opinion rather than a factual error. And um, even when they do make corrections, uh, some investors don't go back and change their vote rec uh, um, decisions. 42% of proxy advisor errors, flaws, omissions, it's reprehensible. I thank you all for your testimony. General My Williams. time's expired, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I, I, I want to get to a bunch of questions, but I want to just start, because I think we're in agreement, but I, I'm, and I don't mean to be cute with time, but I'd ask you just, just to raise your hand right now, if each of you, if you agree with the statement that corporate executives are employees of and therefore directly accountable to their shareholders. Do you, all, do you all agree with that statement? Uh, is there some gray, I see some gray area with some folks. Yeah, they're, they're employees of the company and the shareholders own stock in the companies. Uh, oh, yes, and if I had put all my cash into a company, I would want to have a lot of say over what the people who were managing that were doing. Let's come back to your gray area if we get there. I asked the question that way because I have just quoted Milton Friedman's theory of shareholder primacy which is sort of the central proposition. So we agree with Milton Friedman. There's a rich conversation we could have about stakeholder capitalism, um, but we seem to be Milton Friedmanites today, that's fine. Um, you wouldn't know it on this side of the room because we've had a whole bunch of debates about these uppity shareholders that are causing problems and are creating troubles for companies that are, um, don't want to be responsible to shareholders, but I digress. Mr. Copeland, um, over the last five years, bond funds have significantly underperformed equity funds. Should investors get out of bond markets? Just yes or no, should investors get out of bond markets given their underperformance over the last five years? No. Um, over the last year, the Dow Jones Oil and Gas Index has underperformed the S&P 500 by almost 20%. Should investors get out of oil and gas? No. Okay, I ask you those questions because in April of this year, you wrote an op-ed in the New York Post titled, Having Beat Oil to Only Fans, ESG Activists Now Focus on Big Food, and you said that the ESG bill is going to come due because of long-term economic impacts. If we agree in shareholder primacy, why should we take away investor choice with respect to that asset class, but not with respect to oil and gas, bond markets, or frankly, any other asset class that investors are free to invest in? I don't think we should take away the ability to invest in an ESG fund. We ought to be able to invest in ESG funds. What I'm worried about are passive index funds well, that aren't making buy-sell decisions voting their shares in these You directions. asserted in that article that ESG funds were, were delivering below market returns. You I think in the long run, an ESG fund that screens its stocks is necessarily going to underperform its market benchmarks in the long run. Uh, on, on that basis, so we're mid-cap markets. Every investment fund screens stocks for a certain class. People are free to get in those as they wish. If we're going to talk about returns, though, there have been a bunch of state laws that have taken away the rights for investors to invest in ESG, which my colleagues here are trying to take away choice. Cut away all the other nonsense. They are trying to take away choice. Do you know what it has cost in those states that have taken away choice? How much has it cost the Indiana public retirement system when their state passed a bill banning their pension funds from investing in ESG funds? You know how much it cost them? I, I, I'd have to look very carefully at the study, which I have not read. I'm six sure you're going to say it's six cost them. $6.7 billion. And, how about the Kansas public employees retirement system? Three point, I, I, I'm not aware of the $3.6 billion. Dollars. Texas county district retirement system. $6 billion. These are huge amounts of money that are being lost to the working men and women in this country. And this is going to be complicated for some of my colleagues here who have a hard time with capitalism. If you take away choice, you reduce supply and the price moves, right? These are the costs that we are asking our society to impose. Now, let's, let's talk about some facts. In the last decade, coal use in the United States is down by 40%. We used to make 50% of our power from coal. We now make more power from renewables. The fastest growing vehicle segment is electric vehicles. 
Oil use is flat. Consumers given the choice about what to buy are choosing cheaper energy. Investors given the choice are following the money. Capitalism works. It's also really scary if you can't compete, but it is the only way that we stay competitive as a country, no matter how much the losers cry to their benefactors in Washington and say, can you please take away choice? Capitalism scares me. I don't want to compete fairly. I can't compete fairly. And yet we are now sitting here having a debate, if you can even humor it with that, about whether we as a country are going to continue to support capitalism and free markets and competitive choice among investors. The party of Ronald Reagan, the party of Milton Friedman, is afraid to defend capitalism. You all ought to be ashamed of yourself. But if it's partisan to defend free markets and competitive and investor rights, let's double down on the partisanship because it's the only way we move forward as a country. I yield back. Gentlemen's time is about to expire with that. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is recognized. For if ESG is capitalism, why do we need the government to interfere in the free market? That's what ESG is. That's what the SEC is doing. One of the bills noticed for this hearing is the Ensuring Sound Guidance Act, my bill that amends the Investment Advisors Act of 1940 that provides that pecuniary factors may not be subordinated to or limited by non-pecuniary factors in determining whether an investment advisor is acting in the best interest of a customer. That doesn't take away choice. It merely says that if you want to invest in an ESG fund, it should be disclosed and that this fund is not designed to maximize returns. But it doesn't take away the choice. Now, as you have heard earlier, ESG defenders in this hearing and elsewhere have responded with hysterics even invoking Trotsky to conflate non-owner stakeholders, woke institutional investors, and proxy advisory firms for bona fide shareholders. There is a difference between, as Mr. Cunningham has pointed out in his prepared testimony, an institutional investor and the actual beneficial owner of the capital. And by and large, Beneficial owners of capital in America, the retail investors who are the actual shareholders, they don't care about ESG. They don't. FINRA and the University of Chicago has done a, a survey of retail investors in America, the owners of the companies, not the institutional investors, the actual beneficial owners of the capital, and less than a quarter of them even know what ESG stands for, materiality materiality. They don't care. They want returns. And so my question is, let's get to the crux of this, Mr. Zyker and Mr. Cunningham. Uh, you heard uh, my friend from Minnesota, my former colleague, say, quote, ESG best practices and high market returns can go hand in hand. My friend from, from Illinois, who is, uh, who is a, a defender of ESG, says this all the time. What is it? Is ESG investing actually compatible with maximizing pecuniary returns, Mr. Cunningham? Well, the, the temperature has certainly risen uh, in the room. Um, now ESG investing is a, is a loaded, loaded term, and if you're just solely guided by certain aspects of it, that is not the route to um, long-term economic prosperity. It's, it's, it's Mr. Blending Copeland? two different uh, lanes. Mr. Copeland? ESG investing consistent with maximizing returns, when, when, when social and political issues are prioritized over financial performance, is that conducive, is that compatible with maximizing returns? It's incompatible with maximizing shareholder returns in the Mi long run. Mr. Zyker? Well, it is incompatible in the, in, in the long run because imposing artificial constraints on investment choices cannot be consistent with the maximization of long-run returns. I will say, however, Congressman, that that's not quite the right question. The right question, which we've, we've kind of dodged in this hearing thus far, is not whether people have the right to invest in, in ESG initiatives, however those are defined. The issue is whether regulatory agencies should be creating conditions in which they are forced to do so. And that is the crux of the problem is that the SEC has promulgated regulations which have led to a, such a, 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 an environment in which firms are forced to use proxy advisors, 
They are forced to adopt the recommendations of the proxy advisors. The proxy advisors have no responsibilities in a fiduciary sense to the shareholders and bear none of the attendant costs. That is the problem. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I totally agree with you. And that's, that's why this is not the free market. It is government intervention to distort the free flow of capital. Um, Mr. Copeland, let me finish with you on, on what the prudential bank regulators are doing. The Fed is pursuing a climate scenario analysis pilot program. The OCC, FDIC have all promulgated draft principles for climate-related financial risk management. NCUA has separately begun, uh, begun assessing climate risks. Is this effort about assessing climate-related financial risk, or is it about creating financial risk for energy companies by redirecting capital away from those energy companies? It's, it's absolutely about the latter. And uh, the, the, the access to, to free credit, uh, not to free credit, but, to, but to, to the free access to credit so that everyone uh, on an equal playing field compete with credit is, is really important. And we heard across the aisle someone concerned. Yeah, and in my remaining time, I'll just say, I don't understand why this is, why anyone would say this is about assessing climate risk. Increasing energy prices does not stabilize the economy. Depriving energy Gentleman's companies of access to capital has expired. does not promote financial stability. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, with that, uh, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to point out that the Historic Diversity and Inclusion Subcommittee, of which I used to be vice chair uh, of last Congress, has been eliminated by this Congress. And here we go again with Republican leadership denying climate change, denying that racism and sexism still exist in our society by trying to eliminate the critical and transparent ESG disclosures. To be clear to all the people watching at home, ESG disclosures include information like quantitative and qualitative disclosures related to climate-related risks and human capital disclosures like diversity and inclusion. Bottom line, it's about transparency. All the Republican-led bills discussed today are just more attempts to deny the truth and ultimately eliminate diversity and inclusion initiatives just because Republicans think that they're woke, whatever that means. By eliminating corporate diversity and inclusion efforts, Republicans are directly harming communities like mine in my district, which is 77% Latino and over 90% people of color. Republicans are denying communities like mine the opportunity to be fully represented. Corporate America, and in particular, corporate American leadership, boardroom executives, and sometimes even the general workforce do not always reflect the true diversity of the American people and the people they serve. This is part of the reason ESG disclosures are so very important. Again, ESG disclosures are about transparency. This benefits workers, consumers, and investors. The public has the right to know this information. In fact, research shows that companies that are more diverse and are more successful Companies that fail to prioritize diversity and inclusion are putting themselves and shareholders at a financial disadvantage. As I mentioned earlier, the disclosures we're discussing today include information on human capital, or what I like to call worker treatment or workforce investment. In an attempt to combat some of these bad Republican bills, I'm introducing a bill today called the Workforce Investment Disclosure Act. This bill was led by Congresswoman Axney last year and I'm proud to be the lead this year. This bill requires publicly traded companies to disclose annually information regarding workforce management policies, practices, and performance. This in in includes disclosures on demographic information, data on temporary and contract workers, employee turnover rate, employment skills and capabilities, workforce health, safety, and well-being, findings of discrimination, and finally, employee compensation benefits and incentives. This bill, quite frankly, should be a no-brainer. Again, it's about transparency, and even executives agree on the importance of human capital and workforce investment. In fact, 71% of public company executives identify human capital as one of the most important sources of economic value within their companies. I also want to remind my Republican colleagues that many of these ESG uh, uh, disclosures have a direct impact on workers, too. We have spent a lot of time talking about investors today, 
But I wanted to bring it back, much like Mr. Kasten did. This is really about the workers. As Attorney General Ellison noted in his testimony, public employees in his state trust him with a portion of their salaries to re to re for a return for a secure retirement. This is about our workers. It's about their choice. It's about transparency. Again, in my district, it's largely working class, and I urge my colleagues to remember that when workers are happy, paid well, and treated with respect, companies benefit and profit, and it helps ensure stability. If companies are doing what they're supposed to be doing, prioritizing diversity, treating workers well, then there is no need to be afraid of disclosure. Mr. Attorney General, I wanted to follow up with a statement that you made about Texas. Tell me more about the $532 million a year in interest rates that, that Texas lost uh, when they passed the anti-free market legislation. Would some of these policies that are being discussed today on these bills cause that same kind of impact on the taxpayers? Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, let me tell you, um, the information that my research yielded is that it, that 532 million loss in one year was is a result of a requirement that any banks that invested in uh, uh, that that did did, did not want to invest in guns or oil industry products would be punished. That meant there had to be a fairly abrupt uh, reallocation of resources, and that led to losses in the to the tune of about $532 million in a year. Yeah, I think they were going after businesses that that, that come to Texas, so. Gentlewoman's um, time has expired. Thank you, I, I may follow up, Mr. Chairman, with a written question. Thank of you. course, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Hill, and thanks to Chairman McHenry for holding this hearing, and thank you to our witnesses for being with us today. Mr. Allen, Earlier this year, ISS, the largely unregulated German-owned proxy advisory firm, announced a new, quote, board-aligned voting policy, unquote. An ordinary reading of the name board-aligned would suggest that under this policy, ISS would recommend votes in line with how a company's board would vote. But that's not exactly true under the policy. So, Mr. Allen, could you explain how the name of ISS's new policy is misleading? Uh, thanks for the question. And, uh, no, certainly when we first heard about this new policy, and it came out right after the uh, group of Republican attorney generals wrote letters to ISS and Glass-Lewis expressing their concerns about uh, the lack of alignment with uh, the fiduciary duty of, of investors, uh, we, you know, I heard somebody from another organization refer to it as a red state voting policy. But upon closer review, and we compared it to the ISS benchmark policy, we found that w with the exception of a handful of environmental and social proposals, the, the, the uh, policy was essentially identical to the ISS benchmark policy, including ISS policies on board diversity, on executive compensation, takeover defenses, so somebody voting, uh, you know, opting for this policy through the, you know, that's an ISS client, would be misled if they thought it was, they were uh, opting to, to have their shares voted in accordance uh, with management uh, recommendations or board recommendations. So Thank we you. wrote a letter to ISS expressing our concern. We also shared it with the SEC and members of, of this committee. And, you know, in our view, it's, it's, you know, this is something the SEC should be concerned about. The SEC is doing a rulemaking on fund names, and in the in the proxy advisor context, these uh, custom or specialty policies are, are like ISS's main product. So we think it should have a an accurate name and not something misleading like borderline. Thank you. Mr. Allen, is ISS transparent about the criteria that it uses to determine whether a company's environmental and social disclosures are adequate? Um, the ISS, to its credit, does do an annual policy survey, uh, but other aspects of their policy setting uh, are less than, than transparent. Um, certainly, you know, some of their policies on executive compensation, you know, equity plans, they don't fully disclose their methodology because they want, you know, companies to buy their um, subscription services. So, um, you know, on some matters they are, some matters they, they, they aren't. I mean, it's, 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 it's a mixed uh, bag, but uh, 
Certainly, we think that there should be, be more transparency. ISS should provide more time for companies and others to comment on their proposed policies every year, usually it's a short period of time, and that there could certainly be improvements in that area. Thank you. Mr. Copeland, I'd like to discuss the overlap between the SEC's rulemaking on climate-related disclosures and the SEC's recent staff legal bulletin 14L. And time is short, so I'm going to try to move fast. Mr. Copeland, is it true that the SEC's rulemaking on climate-related disclosures requires large publicly traded companies to disclose Scope 3 emissions if they have made climate-related targets or commitments? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Copeland, under the SEC's recent staff legal bulletin 14L, significant social policy issues like climate-related proposals no longer need to have a nexus between an individual company and the policy to be included in a proxy statement. Do you believe this will make it easier for climate-related commitment proposals to make it onto a company's proxy statement? Yes, and it already has. Thank you. I tie these changes together because climate activists like As You So are trying to make it more likely that a company that companies make climate related commitments and thus must disclose scope three emissions under the climate disclosure framework. I'll note that As You So As You So alone has filed 25 climate commitment related proposals this year. Mr. Allen, one of the bills attached to this hearing would eliminate the significant social policy issue exception to the ordinary business exclusion in Rule 14A8I7. Can you discuss why SEC staff should not be making subjective judgments about whether a particular shareholder proposal is a significant social policy issue? We think that's an entirely subjective analysis and it's beyond the SEC's mandate to, to make such determinations. Thank you. I, I see time is short, so I yield back to balance my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, is now recognized for five minutes. I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for the hearing today. Uh, while I disagree with the posture of the hearing, uh, these are issues uh, that are actually imperative to our financial sector and really are a business imperative. Uh, they're an imperative because it is customer driven. Uh, it, it's around new products uh, that my colleagues are so quick to deride they only exist because there's a market for them. And I just find it completely interesting that somehow uh, the market can't uh, lead in this particular area. Why would we deny wide swaths of investors the information they care about when they are making investment decisions, especially when this is information that already exists in many instances? We're spending our time obsessing over manufactured culture wars instead of doing the, American, doing the work of the American people who sent us here. Our focus should be on the actual issues that our country faces, such as expanding access to capital for small businesses, bolstering financial literacy efforts to build a more inclusive financial sector, or addressing the ever skyrocketing cost of housing. Because I know that these issues like housing are the problems that my constituents grapple with around the dinner table not over dictating how investors to deci decide how to manage their money. Actually, I'm glad that we have an opportunity to discuss just how detrimental it could be if we blind ourselves to the very real risks associated with a company's mismanagement of social, environmental, or corporate government go governance factors. I'm really baffled that I have to say this, but I believe that our nation's investors and other financial services professionals know best how to manage their risk. They are in the business of managing risk in all of its forms, and any risk that these pro professionals deem to be material should be included within the dec decision-making process. Without considering a company's exposure to climate change or the ongoing implementation of a meaningful diversity and inclusion strategy, shareholders and investors will bear the cost for any potential catastrophes. These are costs that managers must be able to price into their investment strategies, but the only way that that is possible is through our work here to promote principle-based disclosures. These investors at least deserve to have access to complete information before making their own decisions on where they want to invest their money. Attorney General Ellison, it's great to see you. 
Uh, thank you. For, Likewise, thank you. Thank you for being, uh, t taking the time to be here. I, I hope that you can help me understand where this supposed ESG push is coming from at the federal level or in your home state. Have you seen these feared mandates or that the government's focus is truly on costly, non-material issues at the expense of the U.S. public markets? Is that something that you're, that you're seeing? No, it's coming from uh, pension beneficiaries. It's coming from members of our community. It's coming from uh, a diverse group of Minnesotans who uh, want the uh, Minnesota SBI to think about governance, to think about so social factors in certain considerations, and, and also to think about uh, in the environmental impacts. I mean, as I noted before, uh, it's a real example that one of the companies that the SBI was invested in actually owned a plant where, uh, you know, 14-year-olds were being used to clean a kill room floor in a meatpacking plant. Now, it, it might be cheaper and add to the bottom line to use 14-year-olds to clean your, your, your kill room floor in your meatpacking plant but it's not legal and it certainly is exploitive. So investors wanna know that kind of information. They, they think that is important uh, and, and people will come to our SBI meetings and demand that we do something about it. So, I mean, it's, it's not like we're looking for these things. We just think it would be important for a company to say, okay, we're, we are looking at child labor. We're looking at human uh, you know, trafficking. We're looking at governance. Thank you. Well, and the last issue that I won't have time to speak about is diversity, equity, inclusion. And I'll just close my comment on this issue to say diversity is a strength for these companies. It is good business for investors to know these strengths, and even more importantly, a company's weakness prior to investing. With that, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stiles, now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to thank Chairman McHenry for calling today's hearing. I think it's really important that we dig in to how our federal agencies are weaponizing Americans' retirement accounts to achieve political objectives that can't be achieved through the ballot box. I'm concerned about Americans' retirements being used for purposes other than analyzing risk in return. And in particular, we see a duopoly of proxy advisors who I think have a disproportionate voice in the voting of shares is more and more Americans are turning to index funds, passive investments, in particular through asset managers across our country. And if I can, Mr. Cunningham, with you, is we've seen a spike in shareholder proposals. Fund managers seem to be relying more and more on this duopoly of proxy advisors, in particular ISS and Glass-Lewis, which dominate the industry. And the impact that that's having my legislation, and I think a really important piece that I've been working on, is that there should be more transparency as it relates to the process with which these proxy advisors are reaching their conclusions. Do you think there's a reason that these proxy advisors shouldn't have to disclose their internal methodologies um, and the staff qualifications that they have uh, as they're making these recommendations? Sorry, I was looking at you, Mr. Allen, and I'm asking Mr. Cunningham, but <laughs> okay. we'll start with Mr. Oh. Cunningham, I'll come back to you, Mr. Allen. No, thank, thank you very much. I, I think the rise of the proxy agents, uh, pro proxy advisors, was a response to the uh, explosion of index fund investment. Mm -hmm. The index fund business model prevents those firms from studying every company and evaluating every subject. So the proxy advisors grew up to provide that service, and initially it was a, an attractive thing to do. Uh, but they're unsupervised, uh, unregulated. They owe no fiduciary duties to American investors. They have no obligation to disclose conflicts of interest they see. They have no obligation to explain why their recommendations are in the best interest of investors. Um, they're not required to fact check their recommendations with companies. Um, so you think all these things that they should have to do these? I, yes, I take it I from know, your comments, right? Yes, and, and the Congress has studied this industry for 13 years. Well, is, there, is, what, is there a reason that Chairman Gensler struck down the rule made under, under Clayton that was reviewed, analyzed, to put these proxy advisors into a form where they would have to disclose? Is, yeah, the, is there a reason that Gensler should have done that other than to try to continue to allow 
these proxy advisors to hide what they're doing from the American people? Well, I, I supported the 2020 rule revision, which was hard fought and a compromise with the, with the proxy advisors. I think it should have gone farther, but, but should Gensler have, have struck it the way that he did? Well, it was a compromise, worked out over a long period of time, and it was a surprise that uh, Chairman Gensler... You'll take it as a surprise. I'll take it as a bad action. Mr. Allen, do you, do you think that Chairman Gensler should have struck the rule on proxy advisors to bring them into the light rather than allow them to continue to not have to disclose their methodologies and practices? No, I supported the... No, I'm, let, me, let, me come to, so, let me come to Mr. Allen here right. on, on that. Uh, no, no, we completely disagree with the SEC's uh, action to reverse the 2020 rules. Uh, you know, we think there was no new circumstances, no new facts, uh, other than just opponents of the rules, you know, weren't happy with them. In, 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 I, I agree with you. And as we look at this, what, what happens then when proxy advisors give bad advice? We take the traveler's example where a proxy advisor recommended what would have been an illegal action and voted in favor of that. And then we see a robo-voting move forward, and we see over 40% of these asset managers agreeing with an illegal action that would have forced travelers to reprice their insurance based on race, illegal, in states across our country. What's the ramifications for that? Well, it has serious ramifications for travelers and other companies in those situations. Well, what's the ramifications? I agree that it, it does for, for travelers and for companies across our nation that are fighting against being told to do illegal behavior. What's the ramifications back to ISS and Glass Lewis for giving this disastrous advice? Is there any? There, there really isn't, because part of the problem with the duopoly is that their clients don't have really many other options. And so their, their ISS and Glass Lewis are unaccountable for their bad behavior. Is that right, Mr. Copeland? Yes. And, and Mr. Zeichert, should, these, should, these, should this duopoly remain unaccountable to the American people? Well, I, I don't believe so, but I, I do believe, however, that the, again, the major problem is the SEC regulatory environment that forces the private sector to use them. It, Were that not in existence, I think the transparency problem also would disappear. Yeah, I, I would love to see this duopoly broken up and more players in this space, but I remain incredibly concerned about the duopoly that we have in the proxy advisor space that is pushing forward this agenda it's problematic for Americans' retirement because it's allowing America's retirement mm -hmm. funds to be weaponized for political purposes rather than to be used to actually analyze risk and return. Mr. Ge Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity and also want to thank the ranking member and these five distinguished gentlemen for being here today. Thank you very much. Um, you know, sometimes timing is everything. And this week, the newspaper headlines have been screaming about climate disasters. New York Times, floods, fires, withering heat. Climate change brings new disasters every day. Flooding classes, closes roads, and, um, and turns through much of Vermont, New York Times. The heaviest rain ever in Japan's south sets off floods and landscapes. Heat wave, maybe the longest ever, and temperatures will likely increase. Northeast storms dumps over two months' worth of rain on Vermont. Helicopter and boat rescues underway across a devastated Vermont. Do any of you gentlemen think that human actions with respect to the use of fossil fuels have contributed to these climate disasters? And you can start in any order you'd like. Yes, sir. Okay. But just don't go long because I don't have a lot of time. If you, if you look at the peer-reviewed literature, what you will learn is that since the end of the Little Ice Age, global temperatures have risen about 1.1 degrees, of which roughly half is due to increasing atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gas emissions. So the narrow answer to your question is yes. Mankind's activities have influenced the climate, and we can detect those effects. The next question is, are those effects large, and is there evidence of a crisis uh, in, in the sense of the several examples that you have, have cited? The answer is no. No, okay. So no evidence of a crisis. No evidence of a crisis. It's not the same as saying right. that there's I get no it. evidence that, that anthropogenic emissions have had an effect. Right. They have. But it's not a crisis, and you wouldn't say that the burning of fossil fuels 
has been a large part of the crisis that we do see. I don't think we see a crisis, and therefore I don't okay. think fossil fuel. All right, fuel fair will enough. Be. Fair enough. Anyone else give it a shot? Yes, sir. Yes, I, I, I think that that human activity has had an impact on the climate, and um, I think there's at least a, 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 a theoretical link between some of that activity and and certain climate patterns that we may or may not see. I also think, however, that the human cost in terms of loss of human life over the last century from climate-related events has gone dramatically down, and that's because of the broad economic growth that we've seen in our country, and therefore I think it's very important that we consider that economic growth and our capital markets and financial regulatory structure as a part of that so that we can remain a wealthier country and more resilient to climate impacts. Okay, anybody else? Mr. Ellison, yes sir. I would say certainly uh, human activity uh, has contributed to a chaotic uh, climatic environment. There's no doubt in my mind, and I would disagree that uh, it is not causing a crisis. I think it is, and I think it's causing a crisis in, 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 as it relates to agriculture, species, uh, weather, uh, you know, weather events, and I think it's a serious problem we have to uh, address. And, and, of course, you're more in line with most of the scientists that are saying it's a, it's, it's a crisis. And it what is because we're burning fossil fuels. Now, how can that not be material? How in the hell can that not be material? That's why investors want to know, you know, what, what is your company doing? Is it investing in a, in a way that's responsible? And more importantly, are your company that's going to be around for a while or not because you are in a situation where you're not paying attention to these risks? And these risks are real. And that's why so many people want to know about this. And time is every, I can't think of a worse time to be trying to pass bills against environmental issues than right now when the headlines are screaming about these climate disasters. Timing is everything. I mean, it really is fascinating to me that these bills are coming up right when the scientists, are saying this is a disaster. And human beings are causing it because of the burning of fossil fuels. And with that, I thank you and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here. And, uh, you know, when I go home to Texas, I'm a car dealer, okay? I'm a car dealer in Texas. I employ hundreds of people for 52 years. And, so when I'm talking to business owners back in my district, I know what they're going to say. And what they say are they're concerned about the SEC's push to implement costly environmental, social, and political regulatory requirements, which will require them to disclose and us climate-related information that is not relevant or material for their companies. Now, businesses are already struggling to operate within tight margins, high interest rates. Their profits are seeing their profits erode. And an increase in compliance costs could be even more of a tipping point to their future. The SEC's proposed climate requirements will cost companies millions for them to ensure they comply. And I'm worried about this proposal will discourage companies from even getting into business or entering or staying in the public market, which will hinder competition, stifle economic growth, and go back to jobs. The biggest issue is that the SEC does not even have the legal authority, and we've talked about that today, to enforce climate-focused regulations. And this proposal exceeds the SEC's intended mission and their statutory authority, and it's the job of Congress to set an environmental policy, not unelected bureaucrats. So the fact is the Biden administration, here we go again, Bidenomics, does not have the votes to pass a climate agenda through Congress, so they're trying to push climate-related policy through financial regulators, and this committee is tasked with overseeing the SEC, and we must rein in the abuse of the rulemaking process before they cause any further damage to Main Street America. So Mr. Copeland, if the SEC continues to operate outside of their statutory purview, how will their proposed climate disclosure rules negatively impact financial institutions and small businesses, and what will the implications be on the U.S. public market? Well, assuming that they get a rule enacted and it's not overturned in court, and I predict it probably would be, but, but assuming they have an operative rule uh, that does what they're calling for initially, things like scope three emissions, you know, the, the financial institutions are going to have general counsels, right? And the financial institution general counsels are going to say, how are we going to comply with this rule? And, and when you, you start figuring out how we're going to comply with this rule, well, okay, we're going to ask the car dealer 
or we're going to ask the family farmer that Representative Scott was talking about, and we're going to say, uh, you've got to tell us all your climate impacts. And you don't have teams of economists. You don't have teams of analysts to do this. So they're going to you're going to lose access to credit. You're going to lose access to business. And so it's going to be devastating, potentially, on a lot of small businesses and family farmers if this were to be enacted and actually in, enforced. Yeah, these people can't afford lawyers. They can't afford the, these folks. So it is devastating. So secondly, shareholder engagement is one of the most important parts of corporate governance. Now, however, shareholder proposals have begun to try, to try and hijack boardrooms, and we talked about it this morning, and turn them to platforms for political agendas. And that comes at no surprise that the SEC governs this process and has been instigating these groups to submit proposals and do not align with a company's interests or core duties. So it's the duty of an institution to protect the financial interests of all investors, not just a particular group that is trying to be the loudest in the room. And this process must be revised and revised to ensure companies can protect the interests of real shareholders. Mr. Copeland, could you elaborate on the effects that partisan and political shareholder proposals have on institutions' ability to create value, value for all shareholders, not just one select group that is trying to advance a radical agenda. I mean, the reality is, why do we even have dispersed stock ownership and in, 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 in corporations? What, what, what economists will call agency costs are actually higher for, for this type of equity ownership in many regards. Uh, but what they do do is align around shareholder primacy. People brought up Milton Freeman, align, align interests around a single variable, share value, and it makes it easier to do business. When you start making each boardroom a, a, a political football field, then it becomes hard to be an efficient business and do your job. The folks in this body know that this body isn't known for its efficiency, and so making a political football field out of every business is not a good way to run all our businesses. So I've got limited time, and I'll shorten my question. Mr. Cunningham, could you expand on the effects of financial regulators forcing ESG policies on the private sector, what it will have on retail investors and their ability to grow their own wealth? Yeah, I mean, the genius of corporate law is that shareholders get to buy stock, and then they have no duties. They don't have a fiduciary obligation. They don't have to vote. They don't have to do anything. Um, but elect a board of directors, which is the fiduciary body and the overseers of the corporation, and that's the body that should make these decisions. And the shareholders should not be telling the managers what to do or telling the board what to do. When a small subset of shareholders <coughs> do that, they will hurt the other shareholders. Yeah, everybody's an expert. Uh, my time is up. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Talib, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman. I'm uh, really uh, incredibly taken aback. You know, I, I always look at the witnesses that come before us and try to figure out, you know, what lens you're bringing or your lived experience or the, the people that you serve. And when I found out, you know, and again, these are numbers are pretty old, but in 2018, I mean, just look at the witnesses. 2018, ExxonMobil gave American Enterprise Institute $160,000 bringing the total to 4.65, no, keep shaking your head. I wanna know why we're here. Because in Detroit, we had the hottest days. Do you know anything about cities like Detroit, New York, Chicago, where working class people are literally suffering because we do nothing about climate? Nothing. We don't give them the resources, we pull aside, why? Because certain industry, certain industry wanna be deni denied that we even have climate risks and how that impacts people's retirement, how it impacts our economy. It's gonna happen, guess what? You're gonna come right back here and want us to bail you out again, literally. Look at the National Flood Insurance Program. I talk to our chairman all the time. You know, First of all, it is a form of socialism, but okay, that doesn't exist You know, because those are the big mansions on the, on the ocean and those folks get bailed out. But my folks, literally their basements, everything get flooded. They're literally suffering every single day. This whole ESG quote, unquote, whatever debate, you know, it is fabricated political issue. We already know. I mean, luckily there are folks within your industry who have actually spoken up and said, this is BS. That particularly the fossil fuel industry in some cases are trying to protect, you know, their short term profits at the expense of workers, retirees, and communities. Shake your head, but 4.65 million since 2008, this is since 1998, is a lot of freaking money. And I, that's only just the recent amount of money. And I don't even know what everybody else is taking. But, you know, A.G. Ellison, one of the things that I'm, you know, concerned about, and, and you know, again, pensioners, families saving for retirement, 
are concerned about the performance of companies over the decades. They really are. They sincerely are. They actually don't trust them. I got a lot of retirees that don't trust them, y'all. I mean, they're pretty big. So for them, transparency is a wonder. This is exactly what they need to be talking about. This is exactly what they need. They want to be able to access that information. They need to protect their investments. So A.G. Elson, can you touch on the ways that ESG disclosures promote long-term value creation instead of risky or short-term profit-seeking uh, initiatives and movements that they're supporting? Congresswoman, I think they drive a conversation that is essential. I think they drive a dialogue. They allow questions to be asked and answered. I, I agree, immaterial, truly immaterial information, that's one thing. But uh, how climate is impacting people in an urban environment like Detroit, where I grew up, uh, it's everything. People die when it gets too hot for too long. Uh, but also the issue of governance is critical. People want to know, are we getting all points of view in this, in this conversation so that we can assess the risk all the way on a 360 level. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, in the area of social does, does matter uh, to folks. Uh, it, it certainly is an important thing. It's not a mandate, but it is a critical uh, set of uh, considerations, which I think improve shareholder value. It's bet the risk adjustment is more accurate, I think. You know, it is the anti-ESG crusaders here are simply, you know, for me, carrying the water of corporations that don't really want to disclose long-term risks um, to th that their businesses face. And it's true. I don't know how much data we need, how much more studies. I know my folks are really tired of the studies and, the, and constantly, you know, because it reveals everything we're supposed to know, right? But we do nothing about it. We're saying not now, not now, not really. Um, and I don't think I don't I don't think that there is any care of whether or not the heat or the climate uh, challenges are really impacting human life or certain sectors of the business. Um, and you know I I know A G Ellison you're going to give me some examples of material risks related to workplace safety, uh, racial equi equity, uh, workers freedom of association that E S G disclosures might reveal. We can continue talking about that, but for me you know. You lose credibility, like the Manhattan Institute for two decades taking money from Exxon. You lose credibility when you're taking literally money from the people that don't think climate, the challenges are actually here, that we actually have a climate crisis. You lose credibility. I, I, you've got to come here and you've got to understand this is real and it's happening, and saying it's not happening or how somehow it's impacting the private sector and stuff. Guess what? You're all going to end up right here asking us to bail you out. So do something now about it. Don't wait. Don't try to gaslight the American people that ESG is not important. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, is now recognized for five minutes. I want to thank each of you for taking the time to come. <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, as has been noted, for the SEC to, to basically dictate the 500-page um, climate disclosure rule is idiotic. SEC doesn't have the power or the authority, nor is it granted by Congress. Uh, to hear some of the statements that have been made, uh, you know, the, the thing about the um, capitalism, you know, taking away choices. Andy Barr brought the exact point up, why is government needed then? Why is government needed to, to dictate that? Why is government needed to dictate electric cars, which I turned on the news this morning, electric cars are sitting in the lots, the public doesn't want them, particularly when the batteries to run them, uh, cobalt, lithium come from China, as well as aluminum, that's stupid. Uh, it is very interesting when you, when you talk about ESG requirements, um, uh, you know, disclosure, uh, make sure the shareholder knows everything about it. That hasn't been done. Um, and, and in this sense, I'm a real estate de developer. Every, if I put a proposal for you for real estate, you would want to know every line item and where the money goes. Where is that in the disclosures as it relates to ESG? It's not there. I haven't seen it. I'm talking about the money that Ms. Cleve's talking about, the billions of dollars. Tell me how you're going to, uh, where is it spent actually? Where does the dollars go? It goes to groups that have nothing to do with curing, uh, uh, promoting uh, the, the floods she's talking about and the hurricanes, 
A man's not going to control that. That's idiotic to think that. I had a group of meteorologists in the other day who are pretty well experts. I asked them about, uh, you know, the, the comments about man's going to control, how can we control the floods and the um, hurricanes? They laughed me out of the building. And it was at the time that they said, you're not. I said, well, how about Al Gore, who's in Davos, uh, brought up that the oceans were boiling. <laughs> and they started laughing. I mean, he worked himself up into a frenzy. We have yet to have a, we have yet to have a hearing uh, where you had two sides, uh, the Al Gores of the world and, the, and the, the experts to do a counterbalance. We have, I have yet to see a disclosure where the monies that the corporate boards uh, are, manda or I guess adhering to uh, have a line item, this is the firm that's getting this money that's gonna control the environment. I have yet to see that. I'm, I'm, uh, I have to do that every day in my world. Um, you know, Mr. Copeland, efficiency is not exactly a, a word here that's ever used uh, in Congress, because it's not. Um, if two things that, that I would, I think Congress has a role in, uh, one being diversity. Not of race and ethnicity, diversity of ideas and different opinions. That's what the boards have got to have. They fall into this line of just complying because it's the politically correct thing to do that this administration is forcing on the American people. And the other thing I would suggest is uh, we've got to have, if we're going to disclose full disclosure for the, for the taxpayers who invest, for the small businesses who will buy those index funds, let's have a line item of where that money's going, who's, who's getting it, and explain to me how it's going to affect what they're all talking about which is, uh, and, and uh, Mr. Sire, you're exactly right. This isn't a crisis. It's, a, it's a, a crisis by a certain few that are loud and that are board activists. But when we have as many things going on in this country, uh, an invasion at the border, we've got crime, we've got uh, so many things that are threatening our society, and then to, to divert the issue on that is lunacy. Uh, any, uh, I'm running out of time, but... Any of you want to comment on any of that, Mr. Cunningham? Well, I do think that the um, system of proxy voting it has a lot of deficiencies, and um, the shareholder proposal rule has been um, expanded far too greatly to entertain all of these, these major topics of, of debate. And the corporate boardroom, the corporate meeting room really isn't isn't the right forum. And so I, I commend your efforts to try to return to business uh, through the shareholder proposal process. And the, the indexing industry is a wonderful industry, but it's got a problem. It owns the stock, but which is great, but it, maybe it shouldn't vote the stock. Uh, and may, maybe that's the solution. Um, we wouldn't need the proxy advisors either. Thank you so much. So we're out of time. Appreciate your testimony. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Himes, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, before I begin my questions, I'd like to submit the following statements into the hearing from the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, Out Leadership, and Affiliated Businesses, Series, U.S. Impact Investing Alliance, USSIF, Americans for Financial Reform, the Shareholder Rights Group, and Green America. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? We've had bank failures, Silicon Valley Bank. The government had to step in. I'm hearing so much about the proper role of government. The government had to step in, just as it did when I was a freshman in this institution, to rescue the banking sector. We've had the bank failures. We're working in great bipartisan fashion on cryptocurrency, on regulation there, stable coins, FTX. We don't want that to happen again. The SEC is very active. I understand your side doesn't like that. My side may like it more, but, the, but, but we got so much to talk about. And here we are devoting a week to telling private corporations that they're mad for exercising the rights that they have in a free market. It is mind blowing to me. Now look, I'm a Democrat, or actually, I'm an, uh, I'm an analytical human being. So when I see the fact that the seven hottest days in recent history were in the last week, that feels like a crisis to me. Now, my colleague, Mr. Norman, doesn't feel that way. I'm wondering about our witnesses here, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll get more particular here. But of the witnesses, show of hands real quickly, how many of you guys don't accept the scientific consensus that anthropogenic carbon burning is causing an alteration for the worse in our climate? Anybody not accept that? 
If you don't accept that, raise your hand. Okay, we have one witness who denies the scientific consensus on climate change. The rest of our witnesses, the other four, are not raising their hands. I can't breathe in the state of Connecticut because of, fi of fires in Quebec. Florida is going to be underwater in a generation. This is a crisis. And you know what we do in a crisis? We mobilize as a government. Now, I took some economics so I can tell you that there is a free market, Mr. American Enterprise Institute, I'll come back to you. There is a free market reason to intervene here, which is that we're not pricing in the externalities of the burning of carbon. And the free market will not solve this crisis that four out of five of you acknowledge is real and serious. I'm on the Intelligence Committee. We have a real diversity problem within the IC. These are magnificent organizations. I, the, the CIA does great work. It is still too much what it was a generation ago, pale male Yale, and they're working really hard to change that. And if they don't change that, they're not going to be the powerful organization that they need to be. What are we doing here? The state of Texas is losing money because they forbade bond, bond underwriters that are woke, whatever that means, from participating in municipal auctions for bonds in the state of Texas. The state of Texas is losing millions of dollars because of this anti-woke crusade. The last point I want to make is that I respect those on the right who say that we should have free markets. We should. But isn't the whole point of the free market that corporations get to make their own decisions? And yeah, it's a combination of the board and the shareholders, but they get to make their own decisions. And if they make bad decisions, consumers will punish them. Consumers will punish them. So if you believe in economics, and, and Mr. Uh, Zyker, I have a lot of respect for the American Enterprise Institute. I go to your conferences from time to time. It's, a, I think, a principled voice for um, more right-wing philosophy. Where am I wrong about saying that Congress has no role, that the state of Texas has no role in formally or informally telling players in free markets that they shouldn't be woke. Is that a free market thing for the government at the state of Texas level or at the federal level to be saying we're angry about your wokeness? Is that consistent with free market that, principles? That, that is not the premise. The premise is whether or not a regulatory agency should be promulgating rules that force firms and funds to make decisions or to delegate decision making in ways that are not consistent with the fiduciary the fiduciary interests of their, of their shareholders and fund participants. The issue is not whether Congress or the state of Texas should tell people how to spend their money. Of course that's true. Well, well that's, a, that's the larger issue. One side, one party here is running an entire presidential campaign premised on the notion, talk to Disney, that government should bludgeon corporations into their philosophical framework. I'm having a little trouble with this conversation, sir, because you were the one person who raised your hand saying you didn't believe in anthropogenic climate change. No, that's not what I said, Congressman. That I, is I, not what I said. Well, I, I, that is not what I, your statement yield back was. Time is not what I disagreed with. Time has expired. I now recognize myself for five minutes. <clears throat> so, um, I don't think that this hearing is about climate change. Um, there's a lot being done dealing with climate change in, 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 our, in our country, as I think we all know. And the idea of mobilizing a government under crisis, our government consists of three branches of government. It can't be mobilized just in the branch that you happen to control at, at, at the time. I think this uh, hearing's more about laws and the following of laws and the enforcement of such laws. And if the laws are to be changed, it needs to be done by lawmakers, by legislation, who represent the people. It's how our republic works. The Investment Advisors Act, dating way back, almost 100 years, primary responsibility of fiduciary is to run the plan solely in the interests of the beneficiaries and for the exclusive purpose of providing benefits. ERISA law must act in good faith with the best interests of the shareholders in mind and must disclose any potential conflicts of interest. We know of some very large investment companies that have actually written letters saying, you are asking us, SEC, to renege on our fiduciary responsibilities. That's what the case is here. You know, what's next? Investing in foods that are, that are best for people? I mean, that wouldn't be maybe a bad idea, 
but to force individuals to do so. And that's what we're talking about here. We're, we're talking about investment choice versus being forced, quite unlawfully, I believe, by, a, a, uh, by, the, by the SEC. I'll go further to state that, that I, I have a bill. We also shouldn't be forced through European standards. Uh, I have a bill that requires a study on the CS3D, which is an imposition of United States companies to follow EU standards that some of you may be familiar with, uh, which is a really bad idea. Because if such a thing would have passed in 60 years ago, our economy argue, arguably would be about 35 to 40% smaller than it, than it is today. Because of our innovation, because that's what leads the way in this country, not the force of the heavy hand of government, because government, I think we all agree, on both sides of the aisle, usually gets it wrong. So, so Mr. Copeland, I wanna, I wanna ask you this, and just referring back to my bill, I recently asked Secretary Yellen about the EU directives of CS3D. She agreed that Treasury had, had significant concerns. Do you have similar concerns with such EU directives being placed on American businesses? Absolutely. You want me to elaborate? Please, for I mean, a couple of moments. The, 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 there's a, we do not want our international system to be this we attack you, you attack us sort of system. I mean, this, this is what we got out of in the 30s when it came to the trade system, when you had retaliatory tariffs going back and forth and, and, and really shut down world trade and, and exacerbated the depression. We don't want that with regulatory oversight either. I mean, the, the, what they're asking American, what, what they're suggesting is that by 2028, you could have American parent companies with European subsidiaries have to do all these sorts of disclosures based on their regime, uh, even though our regulators may differ from that. And you know, this can go both ways. And I think people in, in Congress and, and in the administration may want to raise yeah. that specter. Handing our sovereignty over for uh, the state of our economy, absolutely, I, I agree with you, thanks. The SEC climate disclosure rule, scope three, I hear all about it from manufacturers, from farmers to supermarkets. Um, you know, such a, such a, a mandate as, as, as this, uh, do you feel that the uh, SEC has, uh, Mr. Zeichel, I'm gonna ask you, do you think this provision um, is very costly to business as well? Does the SEC have authority here? I don't believe the SEC has the authority to promulgate any part of this rule. Um, uh, the SEC uh, under uh, Gary Gensler is obviously trying to become part of the climate crusade and expand its authority and its budget. And I don't believe the rule uh, is consistent with the major questions doctrine as recently decided by the uh, Supreme Court. And, um, and in a policy sense, it's a terrible rule in terms of its economic effects. Right, thank you. So, it, Mr. Allen, I'm gonna ask you this. If this precedent were set by the FEC enacted such a rule for all political agendas pushed by any SEC commissioner, um, how, how would our economy, how would American businesses uh, handle that? I think that that's a, an appropriate to whom are you directing this? Actions taken. I'm sorry, it was for oh. Mr. Allen. My time has expired, unfortunately. We can follow up with it afterwards. Happy to follow up. Yeah. Great. Uh, now the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I was part of a conversation with a CFO this winter, and uh, the topic of ESG came up. And uh, you could tell there was almost uh, a resilience building already by some of the major financial institutions to simply um, make a move that was proactive, and in this case it was on a website, to just basically put up a statement about ESG and how they were concerned about the environment. And, and the conversation then involved him saying, it's just something we're all gonna have to do to get the SEC off our back so why not comply right now? Uh, he didn't take it seriously. And you could see that it was part of this corporate pressure that's continued to emerge. So I, I think um, without being redundant of some of the questions that were asked earlier, uh, can uh, Mr. Copeland, can you discuss, uh, first of all, the harms to state and local funding that could come from ESG mandates, um, like the potential one from an MSRB? Uh, ultimately, I, I, that's where I see uh, 
kind of the crossroad is when you start forcing compliance with this voluntary kind of um, half look at the entire issue that's going on right now. Yeah, I mean, here you've got a, a, a body that's sort of subsidiary of the SEC, sort of quasi-independent, wanting to push these sorts of, of requirements on. And you know, this is very heavy-handed. You're basically telling municipalities all around the country, you know, you have to buy into the CSG thing or you're going to lose access to capital. And you're, you're uh, effectively strong-arming from the top uh, what municipalities can do. And uh, it also is probably just going to raise the cost of capital for those municipalities in general. And, and therefore, that's going to affect both local property taxes and local services, et cetera. So it's something we ought to be really, really careful about and not be heavy handed. That's not really what that, that body's for. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, just to kind of further that discussion, I mean, the other part of this is eventually shareholders are going to kind of see through it, right? And uh, Mr. Zeicher, you, you talked a little bit about this. Obviously, this, this um, the overreaching kind of discussion about uh, you know, how much can a boardroom and a group of shareholders kind of continue to swallow on this front uh, until they say enough's enough because they're seeing the, the impact on, on their investment and their shares? Well, the, the problem is that uh, there are two problems. One, ESG has never been defined very carefully. It is a multitude of goals which inevitably conflict and the question is, what's the trade-offs among them? To the extent that the business sector either chooses to or is forced to incorporate ESG or sustainability, if you want to call it that, uh, criteria into its business and management decisions, the conflicts become greater. The ability and the uh, goal of maximizing returns becomes ever more diluted capital costs rise, capital productivity falls, and with it, labor productivity and wages. The, the implications for the economy are not salutary, uh, which is a reality that the empirical literature demonstrates, I think, uh, I think pretty convincingly. And there's, there's probably a short fuse on compliance with some of these items that will ultimately be set in motion and then what you'll see is a series of penalties when somebody doesn't comply. And I, that's my biggest concern. I, so I, you know, my colleagues have asked the question numerous times, what are we doing here today? We're trying to prevent, once again, the heavy hand of government kind of stepping in and uh, inserting themselves into something that's the basis for this entire committee, which is to govern financial institutions the government and the services stepped, related the to The government it. has stepped in through SEC regulations. The question is, how do we undo that damage? And that is a job for Congress. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Donalds, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, witnesses. Um, <clears throat> Attorney General, good seeing you again. Um, you know, uh, this is a great hearing, actually, and I know that you know some of our colleagues on the other side don't really want to focus on this sector or this what's happening here in our capital markets. And I honestly believe the reason why they either A, don't want to focus on it or B, say it's a waste of time is because it helps them achieve a lot of the uh, political and social uh, ends that they want to see without actually having to come here and vote. So this works a lot better when you have small pockets of activist shareholders bringing uh, board proposals ad nauseum and they kind of overwhelm the, the, the C-suite, if you will, to accomplish these things through the corporate sector that you could not get through the legislative process. And so I see why they don't want to focus on it. I know a comment was made about belief in uh, anthropologic global warming, as it used to be called, or climate change, or whatever you, you want to say it is. Um, no, I actually don't agree with that statement. I don't think that the science is settled. And I think it's interesting in 2023 to people talk about settled science unless you're talking about physics and the laws of gravity and other things that are now tried and true over many, many decades. Um, but no, the science is not settled on that. But at the end of the day, what we're discussing is the real implications, the real world fiscal implications of ESG policy on our capital markets. If you look back to returns for 2022, BlackRock's own ESG screened S&P 500 ETF was down. 20% in 2022. 
it lost 20% of its money. And by the way, if you look at the fees for that fund, the fees are much higher than a baseline ETF just taking the S&P 500 as a basket of securities and delivering it to somebody with an IRA or if it ever got batched into any matrix of a 401k that might be out there, even one that might be available to pensioners in the state of Minnesota. That broad base S&P energy sector ETF was up 50% last year. 50%. Now, the reason why it's easy for me to talk about this is because I actually was a fiduciary. See, I was an investment advisor. I did the job. I would never invest my clients in ESG funds because they are more expensive and the returns are not there. The returns have not been there. And I think the issue that we're starting, we're going to maybe potentially begin to run into is that because you have this chilling effect on the movement of capital into the quote unquote ESG firms, then by the sheer force of capital chasing them versus chasing other companies that either A, do not comply or B, do not conform to the ESG matrix, by their dearth of capital, by default, their returns year over year as a company is going to actually wither over time. That kind of chilling effect is not what the free market was ever created to do. That chilling effect is something completely different, which is an anathema to the free market. Mr. Allen, I know it's been talked a lot about uh, proxy advising and about, frankly, the voting procedures going on with these, uh, with these shareholder proposals. What would you think a good remedy for Congress would be to take a look at this and try to remedy this situation? Well, uh, there were several things that Congress could do. Certainly, I think uh, addressing Rule 14A8 and you know removing some of these social issue proposals from corporate proxy ballots and not requiring companies to have to keep, uh, put these out to a vote of their shareholders, you know, certainly that would help, particularly on matters that relate to ordinary business or that are economically insignificant uh, for a company. You know, as I mentioned in my written testimony, I think you know. Certainly, uh, there should be SEC oversight of proxy advisors. I think the SEC's proposal in 2019 uh, struck the right balance, and, and it called for a draft review process so public companies can review the accuracy and the completeness of the reports before their investors start voting on them. Because part of the problem is that there are a number of smaller you know, asset managers who don't put the resources into proxy voting and, you know, essentially, you know, vote, you know, blindly or in lockstep with the, the proxy advisors. That's, you know, unfortunate. It dilutes the voice of the other investors who are being more thoughtful, including the, the voice of retail investors who uh, own shares directly in companies. No, I totally agree. And I, and I think, look, when it comes to the question of materiality, when it comes to this stuff, at the end of the day, what is material is what matters to the financial operations of the company because the investment is into the company itself, not into the environment writ large, not into the social system of the United States or the world for that matter. It is the going concern of the company. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Kim, is now recognized for five minutes. I want to thank the witnesses for being here. And uh, looks like I'm the last person to ask questions. So hopefully <laughs> you'll take a breath. <laughs> But um, I represent a district in Southern California, which is prone to wildfires uh, because of a bad land management practices from Sacramento. And we have drought and the impact of uh, climate change. And I share the concern of climate change and welcome the opportunities to work together without raising the cost for American firms, retirees, and punishing small businesses with onerous climate disclosure requirements. Nevertheless, the issue at hand here is that the existing SEC rules like 14A8 and the SEC Chair Gensler's decision to roll back the 2020 proxy advisory reforms has politicized boardrooms and directed firms to devote more time and resources on costly non-material proposals. So, let me ask you, Mr. Copeland. According to NASDAQ, in fiscal year 2022, nearly four times more capital was raised in private offerings than in public markets. 
In your written testimony, you mentioned that we have seen the number of companies listed on the U.S. public exchanges decline more than 50% since the mid-1980s. So what do you attribute that decline to? Can you give us some examples? Yeah, I think it's a mix of factors. I mean, one is I mean, this body has acted in ways that increased uh, the cost of being public through Sarbanes-Oxley in 2003. Uh, one is that uh, we've had this more onerous uh, sort of oversight for, uh, being a public company is, is a bit different today for the reasons that Larry Cunningham talked about in his opening statement. I mean, the, 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 the landscape has shifted. And uh, nowadays you're gonna be called to task by these proxy advisory firms that didn't even exist uh, back in the mid 80s or, or they were just beginning in the, back in the mid 80s. Uh, and they certainly didn't exist with the kind of power they had, let alone these big asset management fund families like BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard. They existed, but they didn't have nearly the market share and clout they have now. So you're going to have to answer to all these sorts of, of, of so it's, it, there's a cost to doing business uh, yeah. of being public. Yeah. And, and, and so what we're doing with a lot more private ownership than public ownership, we're creating a two-tiered system of ownership. Uh, so that so that some people, Americans that aren't wealthy, that aren't accredited investors, don't have access to all the same sort of market returns as others. You know, over the five de uh, decades, uh, we have transitioned our retirement system from defined benefit to defined contribution plans like 401k. And in 2019, private sector defined contribution, they had 85.5 million active participants. So in your view, how could the slowdown in IPO activity and costly non-material shareholder proposals impact the returns on retirement savings for Americans? I mean, it unambiguously hurts it, particularly because a lot of these defined contribution plans aren't going to have access to, to private capital sources, depending on, on, on who your employer is. I, I mean, the, the move towards uh, defined contributions is a great move. You don't want to be relying on your employer for your retirement too, because then if your employer goes belly up, you're in trouble, right? So, so this is a good thing in general, mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, not having as many companies in the public markets is a problem. I want to throw out one question to you, Mr. Cunningham. I want shareholders to be engaged in corporate governance. It's part of our democratic process. However, SEC Rule 14A8 uh, sets a very low bar for uh, shareholders to submit proposals for inclusion in a company's proxy statement. Uh, so do you believe that we run the risk of rogue actors like the CCP uh, could game the shareholder proposal process to put our firms at a competitive disadvantage in the global markets? If so, how could we prevent this from happening? Yes, I think there's a great risk when the SEC relaxes all of its filters and permits any proposal to be submitted, especially the social proposals where the judgment of the SEC staff alone will determine whether a proposal needs to be submitted or not, and it, without any nexus to the corporation or its shareholders. And, and that is, the, the, the risks are, are endless of the sort you referred to about competitive disadvantages and just misallocation of corporate resources. So I think restoring that constraint should be a, a high priority. Great. Well, thank you so much. With that, I'll yield back the balance of my time. General Lady yields back. Uh, I would now like to thank our witnesses for their testimonies today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witness of the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I would ask our witnesses to respond as promptly as possible. This hearing is adjourned.